It's not the best choice, it's Spacer's choice. These surveillance devices allow me to monitor you constantly. Please ignore them. My research may not quite fall within legal parameters. I never realized fighting the bureaucracy could be this interesting. You say angry. I say efficient. Hey, Captain. I'm in space. I never asked to be liberated. Shame about the whole squashing thing. Nasty way to go. Not many folk have big pulsating space brains like you. You've tried the best now. Now try the rest. Spacer's choice. Oh, wow, that stings. The Outer Worlds is an interesting game. It checks so many boxes for me. It's a role-playing game. It's from Tim Kaine and Leonard Boyarsky, the guys who, once upon a time, brought us the original Fallout. It's science fiction. It has an interesting Art Nouveau styling throughout. You get your own spaceship and travel the Halcyon system. It's got a familiar gameplay, but it's an original IP, and it's not a prequel, sequel, or reboot. What could possibly go wrong? The Outer Worlds released in October of 2019, just before the critical November release death schedule and award season. Initial impressions looked solid, and it seemed like it would have no issue standing out, despite releasing in the same year as the similarly titled The Outer Wilds from a new significantly smaller studio. And yet, when trophies were being handed out and media outlets were clinking their champagne glasses reflecting on all the games they'd played that year, The Outer Wilds was cleaning up while Obsidian's The Outer World seemed to have disappeared into the ether entirely. So what happened? Where did this game go? Did it kick on its skip drive and coal protocol its way into oblivion? I can't remember the exact moment I wanted to give this game a shot, but I felt motivated to do a full-length review on this game, not just for all those reasons I mentioned in the opening paragraph, but to discover firsthand why the game had, despite the pedigree, despite the premise, despite the strong initial impressions, been forgotten by the gaming world promptly and entirely, like a weird dream. To kick off my investigation, I started with the developer, Obsidian. Let me tell you my experience with Obsidian Entertainment's games since their founding 18 years ago. <clears throat> First off, I bought and played a little bit of Fallout New Vegas. Okay, let's try something different. I know who these guys are, Tim Kaine and Leonard Boyarsky, the co-directors of The Outer Worlds and the producer and art director of the original Fallout respectively, which was developed and published by the PC gaming renowned Interplay. Now I've played that game even recently on our green room streams. Join us in the green room on Saturdays, it's a gaming stream for people who don't like gaming streams. And shortly after it released, Tim and Leonard left to form their own studio, Troika. At the same time, Interplay unveiled their new role-playing game division, Black Isle Studios, which developed and released Fallout 2 the following year, among plenty of other popular PC role-playing games of that era. Fallout 2 wound up being a critical and fan favorite, eventually, but it shipped unfinished, which is a fun little business practice that PC game publishers were starting to implement back in those days to save a few bucks and get games out the door. It was like early access, except you paid full price for a supposedly finished game. It was freaking amazing. A friend of mine had a copy of Fallout 2, and I remember it performed pretty poorly. Load times took forever, and it crashed a couple times. So naturally, being the little truth to power shit I was in 1998, my first experiences on the internet involved going to the Black Isle Studios message boards, which I sadly couldn't find in the Wayback Machine, and yelling at whoever would listen to ask why they would publish such a buggy and unfinished game. And I wasn't the only one. It got so bad that producer Fergus Urquhart came on the boards and announced that they would be shutting them down entirely for the 1998 holiday. <laughs> Interplay may have pushed unfinished games to save a few bucks, but it wasn't enough to save them from bankruptcy in the early aughts. Interplay founder Brian Fargo left to create developer In Exile, while Fergus Urquhart and four other Black Islers left to create Obsidian Entertainment. Fast forward nearly two decades and not only are Tim and Leonard back with Obsidian, but Obsidian and In Exile are now both owned by Microsoft. Funny how things work. Obsidian has developed a storied reputation and passionate fan base, but it wasn't always easy. They spent a lot of their early years building sequels for other franchises like Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2, Neverwinter Nights 2, Dungeon Siege 3, and, of course, Fallout New Vegas. 
They also typically had to ship their titles under duress, so several Obsidian games arrived on store shelves unfinished with technical issues, and honestly, that's been what's put me off their games. That and their heavier RPGs like Tyranny or Pillars of Eternity just seem impenetrable, but maybe they're not. So yeah, I owned New Vegas, having played and beaten Bethesda's decent but disappointing Fallout 3 reboot, and I... I couldn't get into it at all. At all. And I know people revere that game. A lot. I've watched H Bomber Guy's video. I get people like it. I don't know what to tell you. So now we get to the Outer World, which, before Obsidian was acquired, was an opportunity provided by 2K's private division for Obsidian to create an original franchise. In the end, not to bury the lead, they created a game that was very creative, but mechanically conservative and unfinished. Those first two points, interesting, are what really drew me to the game in the first place. I love a good creative game, and I thought I could handle another kind of stock role-playing game. Before we get too far into this, I do want to note that I enlisted a lot of information from Noclip's excellent five-part documentary series on how the game was made. So rather than go in depth here describing how the game came together in development, I've put links to those features in the description and highly recommend you check those out. The Outer Worlds is one of those games, and if you haven't picked up on it yet, it shouldn't take too long to understand exactly what I mean. This is a game that lifts liberally from other games. It's easy to describe it as a series of pop culture references, Ernest Cline style or lack of style. It's the role playing of Fallout with the geography of 2003's Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, with the quirky, sardonic humor of Futurama and the macabre body horror of Bioshock. Tim and Leonard have even called it Fallout meets Firefly, which makes sense considering the Wild West homesteading themes of the game and the characters' subtle, Whedon-esque twisting of the language. At times, the art style even felt evocative of Borderlands, minus the hard edge cell shading. It actually feels kinda odd calling this an original game when it feels so much like a greatest hits album with some killer fresh liner notes. Now I get that all games inspire all other games and blah blah blah, but another amalgamation of a game that I felt borrowed so loudly and proudly was 2016's Prey. Prey is an immersive sim that almost got its own end review treatment and it's really a love letter to the works of Ken Levine, System Shock 2, and the original Bioshock. And playing Prey, you really feel it. Like, somehow, a sophisticated artificial intelligence gathered the files of both of these two games, and with a bunch of processing time at a university supercomputer, Prey came out. The Outer Worlds feels kind of like that, but with actual humans involved with the end product. To contextualize so much of what this game is and isn't, we have to understand the role of its publisher. Private Division is a mark created by 2K to develop quote-unquote double A games. Titles that aren't necessarily blockbusters and certainly don't cost as much. I only recognized one other franchise from this mark, Kerbal Space Program, but these are games that would probably fit right at home in a mid-tier publisher like THQ before the market annihilated that entire segment. It feels like both a way to give a smaller developer a bigger budget for a title and then get more story developers to experiment with smaller, more agile games. Taking a look at The Outer Worlds, it would be so easy to see it as Fallout meets blank and expect those kinds of production values or that amount of content when it really, really isn't. When you don't have an unlimited budget, you have to get clever. A role-playing game can kind of look like anything, but more than any other genre, it requires an incredibly large amount of content. In the balance between a world that always looks fantastic and a game that lasts forever with millions of hours of dialogue or just seems narratively cohesive, this is a game that had to pick its battles and sometimes they weren't always the right ones. What I'm trying to say is that the game would have been better off if they had just sided on making more of the vital content that it wound up lacking in exchange for playing something that probably looks closer to the Money for Nothing video. I'm just saying. This is a game like Knights of the Old Republic that you can easily complete in about 30 hours, but it encourages you to go back through and try things differently, producing the feel that you can get more than one playthrough out of the game. But similar to my experience with Old Republic, in which I felt I experienced the vast majority of the game on the first playthrough, making choices based on my personal values, 
I decided I only really wanted to play this game once. I didn't really want to do a cringe run where I act like a jerkass to everyone to see the evil jerkass content I missed out on the first time around. So not seeing that content was no big deal. But I also worked against my own usual playstyle by trying to complete every single possible quest in the game to ensure I saw as much of it as possible. And to the game's credit, there's still plenty of stuff I didn't see or experience. In the end, I put about 55 hours into the Outer Worlds, including roughly 20 hours between the two DLC episodes. While Obsidian's track record is filled with AA games, including plenty of role-playing games, one potential disaster with being given the license and resources to create a whole new IP is scope creep. And who boy did it sneak up on Obsidian here. It's easy to imagine that this game would have had absolutely no troubles if they'd had a AAA budget, but this is a game crammed into its casing with vital bits still left all the way back in the developer's imagination. The Outer Worlds team was never bigger than 75 people, which is only twice the size of the original Fallout team from over two decades prior, as that wrapped up. With the game's epic content holes, Tim and Leonard acknowledge how much content had to be clipped, including entire planets, just to keep the game focused, on budget, and ship with as few technical issues as possible. On the flip side, the smaller scope and dedication to focus really makes the game feel more curated and dense compared to other games of its ilk. The Outer Worlds regularly demonstrates moments of brilliance, but playing it... Man, playing it can just be a low-energy slog sometimes. There were times when I was enthusiastic to dive back into my adventures in the Halcyon system, and then there were times where if I had to talk about lore with one more NPC, I was going to pop. The Outer Worlds really puts on a show. The art direction is solid and thoroughly realized, manufacturing this real sense of wonder, of literal otherworldliness, that you are somewhere else that only Kepler could glimpse through its really long eyes. The environments you land in feel like they were sculpted from science fiction versions of FDR era WPA posters for US national parks. This was especially true while making my way through Gorgon and its luscious oranges and blue magentas in the domed environment while chomping down glossy surfaces and green neon inside abandoned corporate facilities. I would stop often and just admire the detail of these spaces, dreaming of some future in which I handed the controller over to an interior designer and said, make my dream home look like this. Which would happen the day after a huge sack of money fell from the sky. While the game encribs a lot from the turn of the century Gilded Age inspired game like Bioshock Infinite, its influences span half a century. There are 30s and 40s style radio jingles, the splashes featuring Grey's Anatomy-esque dissections are hand-drawn while Wright Brothers era advertisements are deceptively error-free and vectorized. Despite taking place centuries from now, entertainment isn't a Netflix catalog and a remote, but Aetherwave serials that mimic RKO radio plays and Nickelodeon films. The typeface throughout looks like a take on Futura, the common 1927 German typeface that really took off in the 40s and 50s and is the trademark font of government documents from that era. You've seen it and its condensed version all over the Bethesda Fallout games for a reason. And Skyrim. Yeah, even Skyrim. And then there's the Sputnik era science fiction with planetary rings that span the sky, shrink rays, and the ever optimistic booming orchestrations that fill the soundtrack. For the most part, this weave of influences works, but sometimes the contrast makes it feel less like an inspired original take and more like a Pinterest board of inspirations. The Outer Worlds isn't a slouch technically either. It's not ray tracing anything or pushing poly counts towards infinity, but its Unreal 4 powered visuals are exceptional at times and never ugly, even at their most mundane. There are plenty of shiny surfaces for me to drool over, and the bokeh effect used in dialogue is very pretty. The lens flare is a bit much, and I say that as someone who, decades ago, only opened Photoshop to add lens flare to my work. You get it from the star in the sky, but also far less exciting objects in the environment, like computer terminals and elevator switches. It's almost obnoxious, but I'm the kind of person who can stare at an end cap of glistening and sparkling Christmas ornaments all day. These are really just nitpicks though, because the look of the Outer Worlds is really memorable, even if maybe a bit familiar, like how all the industrial areas look like they were imported from Doom 3. 
What actually puts me off, primarily because of the game's strong emphasis on dialogue and conversations, is character animation. With creatures and hostile characters, you can kind of get away with this because, I mean, we don't really know how they would actually move in the real world because they're not real. But it's the intimacy of conversation where we see the lack of polish, or technology, or money. In the introduction, we see Phineas Wells revive the player character, and there's slightly cartoony and exaggerated movement that really sells us on his eccentric Doc Brown-esque personality. Or if you were born this century, Rick. It actually reminded me a lot of the wonderful hand-animated characters of Id's Rage that really made those characters stand out. But not too far outside the intro, everyone begins to look like code-scripted puppets. For budgetary and logistical purposes, it makes sense that a lot of this had to be automated. But it genuinely feels like a lot of intended emotional impact is lost because of technological limitations. And in the moments where characters appear in even smaller formats, like the tiny tube TVs straight out of StarCraft briefings, they may as well be flapping jaws and blinking eyes because, well, that's really all they are. The audio presentation is really solid. I mentioned the optimistic orchestrated themes earlier, and so much of this music feels like something you could play against early NASA footage and the hopeful dreams of humanity's extremely dangerous voyage into the void. My favorite example of this is the Level Up Stinger. The music was actually orchestrated in Budapest, and while I don't keep track of how often game scores are actually performed by an actual group of humans with instruments, so much music these days, even the instrumental scores, sounds cold and computer generated. These recordings just sound and feel warm and inviting. The fuzzy jingles which Tim Kaine came up with are earworms that'll stick with you. When it comes to the characters, the acting is generally believable, sometimes exceptional, and sometimes, well, eh. We'll talk about characters in Chapter 3. Finally, the Foley work is well produced and complex, and the game marries this to the engine to create great environmental scenery and awareness. I wish the weapons and combat work in general were punchier, but it works. The Outer Worlds is a game that cherishes its writing and its mechanical ability to guide you through conversations and game-altering decisions, allowing for more interesting narratives and stories than your standard immersive sim or Bethesda RPG. It's hardly the first of its kind, but it's a rare example of a writer's room for a game really demonstrating the need for a writer's room for a game. Even if it's highly illusory at points, and regardless of how charming or sarcastic your character is, you end up at the same point, swinging through these dialogue trees can make you feel like you're picking through a choose-your-own-adventure book. It's the primary mechanic that the game employs to introduce this notion of replayability, to see how things could play out. The sheer amount of script is used to craft relationships between your close companions, the people you recruit to join your crew throughout the game. Building up and developing this cast of characters was a primary focus for the team, and it's the most interesting part of the game. There's a lot of great banter here, and as we'll discuss later, this stuff is genuinely funny at times, something that can be hard for a game to pull off. What the fuck is this? Is this French? I can't fucking read French. There are times when the writing actually feels overwritten and dialogue comes off very unnatural, but these are thankfully rare and didn't really distract me from the heavy lifting it does through the rest of the game. The game hosts a lot of characters, establishes a lot of backstory, and if you're a fan of lore excavation, there's a lot to discover in this universe. In my case, however, this could really reduce the game to a labored trudge. We'll talk about the mechanics of dialogue in Chapter 3 and your companion stories in Chapter 4, so stay tuned. Before we dive into the fabric of the Outer Worlds, I do want to point out some miscellaneous presentation issues I encountered. You may notice some frame hitching in the footage and I do my best to try and mitigate that through editing, but that's not actually a fault of the game, but rather the struggles of my half-decade-old hardware trying to run the game while recording the footage. The game is extremely competent under the hood and never crashed, but I know others have different experiences. That said, there are some familiar artifacts of Unreal Engine on display, like the detail and light map pops that take a few frames to materialize when loading into a level. There was this one wall in Stellar Bay that was... between dimensions or something. 
thing. When enemies die, their corpses tend to vibrate and wiggle until the engine turns off their physics simulations. It's a clunky problem and a clunky solution, but well, there it is. Finally, there were rare instances where I couldn't actually select an item in the environment, even if there was no apparent reason why it shouldn't be doing that. So anyway, what are these outer worlds? Hundreds of thousands of colonists left to drift out here forever just to keep from damaging the board's bottom line. Disgraceful. You are a meat popsicle in a tube. If you've played Fallout 4 or Mass Effect Andromeda, this will seem very familiar to you. In the future, the Earth sends two colony ships to the distant Halcyon system to become an interstellar species and populate the cosmos. Your ship, the Hope, didn't make it to its intended destination and has sat adrift, frozen for nearly 70 years, until the outlaw Dr. Phineas Wells frees you from your cryogenic prison. Beyond the character creation screen, you, henceforth known as the Stranger, rarely see the face you sculpt for your avatar. You have no past, you have no present beyond the millisecond to millisecond just-in-time interactions with your controller. Who were you before you were tossed into this rocket ship freezer and sent into the abyss? The game gives you a small option during character creation, but the answer, for all the game is concerned, is simple. You are no Early on, something felt very wrong about the story of the Outer Worlds, and I couldn't quite put my finger on why. I pinched the game's radial vein and occasionally felt a sludgy pulse. It wasn't until I was over 35 hours into the game and had made some good progress in the abandoned research rock Gorgon from the DLC that I realized what was off. This game, this main quest, this golden path, has no drama. The Outer Worlds story has no tension. None. Whatsoever. So this mad scientist, this Doc Brown-like figure, shows up on your abandoned colony ship and abducts you. When the man, or rather, the board shows up, he escapes by the skin of his teeth back to his secret lab. Using some chemicals he has, he revives you, and before you can even have a conversation with the guy, he slams your tube shut and sends you planet-side on your quest to get more chemicals to awaken the rest of the colonists on the Hope. But for all intents and purposes, aside from a couple times you have to pop back to his lab, Phineas disappears from the game. In time, you discover that Phineas is a really wanted figure for some really bad stuff. But why? And what? Does the game get into this, providing depth, or the beginning of a believable character arc to your madman savior? At a point something like an hour into the game, you meet local law enforcement and you're presented with the opportunity to turn in this madman of science, this terrorist that you don't even know. Does this affect the story in any way? So you acquire a spaceship, get off the planet Phineas shot you toward and meet him in his lab, but he keeps himself separate from you and your party, protected by some invincible glass. And you know what? My senses are tingling. He keeps talking about this chemical he needs to revive the rest of the colonists on the Hope, but how do you really know that it's the same chemical he used to revive you? I mean, what did he really do here before with this lab? How do you know that you, a free agent untethered to this future society that erected itself while you sat frozen in deep space, aren't merely being used as his instrument to acquire these chemicals to develop some kind of bioweapon to commit genocide and assert himself as a tyrant of the entire race of master friggins. So that's the frame story. Madman wakes you up, he wants chemicals. You spend a couple dozen hours getting him these chemicals and the golden path is basically a few narrative nodes along the way. It's a narrative carrot on a stick, except the stick is like, uh, like a quarter mile long. So what in Halcyon does this game offer between point A, when you're fresh out of the freezer, and point B, where you're grabbing a punch bowl full of the chemicals to motivate the player to make that journey? You know, we think capitalism has gotten pretty bad these days, and it has, it has, but the future this game projects involves massive corporations purchasing the entire legal rights to colonize a solar system, Halcyon. As a result, the introductory brochure Pan reveals, pretty much everyone who made it to Halcyon did so as an indentured servant. Hmm, where have we experienced the premise of ceding personal liberties to the whims of faceless legal entities? Hmm, oh, I don't know. 
everywhere. But the corporations pitch this as a kind of manifest destiny, like America's push to the Pacific, minus some of the dreadful genocide, to roll your wagons west with the promise of adventure. But because the company owns everything, the concepts of homesteading and personal ownership are conveniently subdued or absent altogether. Still, even if the idea of owning a slice of these strange new worlds, learning a trade and becoming self-sufficient, once a hope of English egalitarians and colonial Americans pre-industrial revolution is the stuff of pipe dreams, companies like Spacer's Choice are happy to sell you prefab modular structures to serve as homes, or restaurants, or offices. It's actually a very convenient reason for the game to recycle the same structures throughout its worlds. Hell, Spacer's Choice even sells faux windows to make them look like, you know, not solid prefab shapes, even if they have no actual function for the inhabitants. You'll find several of these windows unplugged or just tangling off buildings throughout the game. The Halcyon system, as far as we're concerned, is two planets. Terra 1 and Terra 2, plus a myriad of smaller destinations. It's actually a bit confusing because the game starts on Terra 2, which I thought was the first colony out here because our home system was Terra 1. But Terra 1 is actually Terra 1, which is also confusing because everyone just calls it Monarch now. And Monarch isn't a planet, it's a moon to Olympus, a gas giant. The thing is, the corporations brought terraforming technologies with them, and you can see them implemented across the system. But on Monarch, they failed, which created the vicious wildlife you fight there, and, well, everywhere else. The Halcyon Holdings Corporate Board, or more simply, the board is the quasi-governmental entity that runs the Halcyon system and is a council of the system's 10 founding corporations. Well, they abandoned Terra 1 and made Terra 2 and based themselves out of Byzantium with satellite, um, embassies throughout the system. Terra 2 is now the colony and the capital of Halcyon from its brimming and wealthy city of Byzantium while Monarch is the failed lawless quagmire where remaining colonists struggle against the wildlife and the elements. Monarch is the colony with the large overland map that binds all of its locations together, while Terra 2 has three separate compartmentalized areas that don't really gel together. In development, Terra 2 originally also had an overland map that bound them together that was as large as Monarch's, but it got yanked as they needed to scale back features. Outside these two worlds, there are two colony ships, Phineas's labs, some research stations, the Eridanos platform, and the asteroid Scylla and Gorgon as smaller steps along the way. We'll explore those later. Now, for most of the game, the board as an entity was kind of confusing, because it's this amorphous, bureaucratic layer that things have to be done through. They have the power to condemn entire worlds. The chairman of the board is Rockwell, the CEO of Universal Defense Logistics, which provides the board with its military power. You'll know which enemies are board guns because they'll go by corporate commander, or corporate trooper, or whatever. That these relationships are somewhat confusing is maybe the whole point. Corporations own the government, run the government, are the government, and the only thing separating them all is semantics. Even if the game's hyper-capitalist dystopia is hardly the most original concept in the universe, as a role-playing game, the Outer Worlds has the structure to really plumb the depths of this concept. Of course, in our modern society where wealth inequality is at its greatest chasm in a century coming off the worst viral outbreak, in a century, the notion of well-off secure business entities comfortably calling the shots while the rest of us loot our couches for rent money can be a pretty uncomfortable environment to portray. So the Outer Worlds plays a balance between humorously cynical and emotional honesty. I mentioned the score earlier, but the soundtrack of Halcyon is really those catchy jingles to buy crap. Between those earworms and their memorable mascots, like the Moon Man of Spacer's Choice, the board attempts to put a smile on the soul-crushing environment they've created here in which only a few benefit. The Outer Worlds plays with this notion of generations of ossified classism with ongoing jabs at the status quo. If you have the rough-and-tumble space-neck Felix in your party when you arrive in Byzantium, he notes the lack of a Rizzo's, which is like complaining about the lack of a McDonald's drive through on Rodeo Drive. But that's perspective. A place that's clearly so valuable like Byzantium that doesn't have the comforts of your home like this low-class vending machine or other familiar icons of safety or comfort is junk or foreign or classless. I do think there's a Rizzo's vending machine in Byzantium somewhere anyway, but that's beside the point. 
Each person you talk to in the Outer Worlds that isn't an authority figure, and well, even them too, have some opinion about the system the boards created and reflect whatever degree they've been coerced into accepting it. In Stellar Bay, you encounter workers on strike from the local Saltuna warehouse. They're the other Saltuna capital in Halcyon, I guess. And between the workers and their supervisor, you realize the impasse. The workers want better rights and pay for the grueling necessary work they perform to keep the economy moving. This low level level supervisor can't give them those. As an interloper with no authority whatsoever, what do you do? What can you do? The thing is, even as these workers refuse to work, Stellar Bay is hardly a paradise. One does not simply live on Monarch, one survives it. Outside the walls of this settlement is a hostile landscape, pocked with corrosive sulfur pools and loaded with bands of roaming marauders, acid-spitting raptodons, snozwangers, vermicious canids, and other dangers ready to gobble you up. Or worse. But of course there's a dark side to this classism and hypercapitalism. The generations of colonists who have served these corporations with no way out. In fact, whether by design or logistics or both, there are no children in this universe. Which already rings true as a real world scare about bringing children into a dark and twisted world in which parents can't begin to provide for themselves, much less their offspring. The common people of Halcyon know little more beyond their company assigned station in life and the Aetherwave dramas that describe worlds beyond their imagination. Lower class families of Halcyon are regularly dismantled and reorganized in favor of thicker profit margins. This justifies these corporates' coercion and re-education programs both among the hyper-capitalists themselves, but among those who serve them all the way down to the muddiest outpost. Those who question their place or begin to question the structure of society as unfair are ostracized as lazy and unhelpful by their peers and neighbors. These people are employed for their physical labor, not their mental labor, which would inevitably seek to overturn authority. Those who do take action are considered traitors or deserters. Does any of this sound familiar? I believe the saddest example of the nightmare that the Outer Worlds creates is that of Amelia Kim a bartender in Edgewater, your first destination after literally landing in the game. She tells a story of how she once dreamt of becoming a scientist, but she asked too many questions and was re-educated and posted here. She apologizes for her once ambitions and praises the notion that she's been disabused and placed here like an asset, like a lamp in a dark room. Her universe is incredibly small and a place like Byzantium may as well be back on Earth light years away. She looks and sounds tired, weary, and abused, nearly on the verge of tears until you validate her youthful dreams, and then she pipes up to defend her tiny little lot and the abusive corporation that assigns her purpose. Even sadder, people are like this, and their horrible heroes exist in the real world too. In this galaxy, humans are seemingly a byproduct, a matter of waste, trash that both enables, but also piles up and slows the machine. To the lay person, everything is arbitrary, and arbitrary is normal. Welcome and if they were trained as specialists, specialists it won't matter when the company decides to change their position in life on a whim. Flying. One of my favorite examples of pitch black humor in this game is the year-long journal of a scientist that was randomly assigned to handle garbage processing alone on Gorgon, detailing the curiosities and fascinations of a person slowly losing their mind. It's also on Gorgon that we discovered what Spacer's Choice actually does with its research participants. It's Freaking dark. There are 10 mega corporations that form the board, but the Outer Worlds isn't interested in being comprehensive about what all of those entities are. The machinations of Mahalcyon can be overwhelming as is, but this actually helps build some scale in a story that winds up making you Halcyon savior. Or not. Some marks do stand out pretty quickly though. Spacer's Choice is the consumer brand of UDL, and they make shoddy products across their entire portfolio. You'll see Moon Men on billboards and posted in their booths. Auntie Cleo is a pharmaceutical brand that reminds me a whole lot of Futurama's Mom Corp. There are plenty of other smaller businesses as well, like the cri uh, I mean, less than legal, I mean, well above board Sublight, which is largely a logistics business, so you know, for things that aren't illegal, at least not clearly. This. And then you have Rizzo's for your liquid flavor. In contrast with the grim seriousness of these people's terrifyingly undervalued lives, the game pokes fun at the whole thing. A lot. Frequently. At every opportunity. While the game's sad stories can wear on the soul over time, the cynical levity lifting jabs at just how ridiculous this all is will wear out very quickly. 
The game devotes a large quantity of its moment-to-moment, location-to-location energy, informing and then reminding you that Halcyon is clearly run by incompetent sociopaths. But once you've laughed at the notion that money makes the Halcyon system go round and that people who don't have thick currency are essentially disposable, you, uh... Well, it just starts to hurt instead of amuse. Fixing this universe, however, is gonna take some work. Time to feed the flames. It's nothing personal. Promise. Is this what carbon monoxide poisoning looks like? I don't think this deck is too well ventilated. Uh, speaking for myself, Captain, I am not of a mind to be murdered by a psychopath who plays with fire. So let's get to the point I mentioned earlier. This is one of those games. The Outer Worlds is a role-playing game, but it also serves as a very complete immersive sim, allowing for multifaceted gameplay. Considering my past couple reviews for Deus Ex and the Thief series, this game slotted right in mechanically and felt very familiar to those games and others I've played in the past. What you've probably already discovered watching this review, or even in playing the game, is that despite adventure being a core theme, it's actually a very conservative game. For the record, I did play with my reliable Xbox One controller, but I did have some issues from time to time as far as the design, which we'll get into. Much of what you do in this game is based on your character's skills, so you'll find so many interactions with other people or the environment will rely on simple if-then checks of whether that particular skill is high enough. You don't get to experience real RNG until you get into combat, which we'll get into, don't worry. One of my favorite parts of the game is when you successfully use a skill and a nearby companion will validate it with a good job. Mm, clever. Similar to Tim Kaine's Fallout, there are no classes in the Outer World to bias particular sets of skills. Instead, you're given a pretty level playing field to sculpt as you see fit. Different companions will have their own specific skills though, so if you bring them into your party, they'll augment the skills you have. You'll have 30 levels to chip in points towards your skills, plus 3 more if you have Paralon Gorgon, and 3 more if you have Murder on Eridanos. You gain experience points to level up by doing all the typical role-playing game stuff. You kill things and get XP. You explore a new area and get XP. You successfully use skills and get XP. But the biggest payouts will come from turning in quests. So many of my level up stingers came after informing a quest giver I had completed whatever bespoke objectives they sent me out into the cold and dangerous wilderness for. And then there's the loot. The loot. Loot, 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 loot. These worlds are packed to the gills with crap to pick up. Thankfully, it's all outlined so you can even see these items in bins and dark areas. In a distinctly libertarian move compared to Skyrim, which I'm playing at the same time I'm producing this video, you can deliberately become encumbered with loot, which will make you move at a snail's pace and prevent you from using fast travel. That is, unless you pick the perk that allows you to get around this. Skyrim, helpfully, prevents you from picking up more items if it'll encumber you. Let's face it, encumbrance sucks, and while we complain that games are simplifying things and holding our hand, design decisions like this conveniently eliminate the penalty of bad choices by removing them entirely. Hmm, let's think about that as we move through this review. I never learned to visually distinguish between the game's three major kinds of ammunition, so I just reflexively always took it all, every single time. Armor and weapon parts to fix those up are freaking everywhere, and you may as well just pick them up. You'll always need them, they weigh nothing, just do it. There are also points where you can steal items that are out what in the open, or are privately owned, and if you get caught, you can do very simple speech checks, since your three speech skills are tied together anyway, to get out of pretty much any incident at the cost of some reputation with whatever faction you just pilfered from, or some coin from your wallet. In these worlds, there are even Tossball collector's cards, Tossball being the game's fictional sport of choice, and it doesn't even seem to amount to anything. There's no trading component or deck building minigame to speak of, it's just here are these random toss ball cards with different names on them and there you go. Apparently they find their way into companion cabins on your ship, which, okay, seems like a missed opportunity there. One last note on loot, for now, is that in rows of lockers, only ones with lights on them actually have any loot. I only discovered this late in the game and it felt it would have saved me a couple seconds here and there and then eventually hours. Like other games of this ilk, you have a deliberate starting point where you roll your character, 
which is a misnomer because there's nothing random about creating your character unless you close your eyes and slam through the menus, or if you select the randomize option when creating your physical appearance. Speaking of which, the face sculptor will be a familiar sight if you've played anything from Skyrim to Saints Row. You can adjust your character's appearance to the typical insane degree, adjusting cheekbones and sculpting eye sockets, but in the end it doesn't matter because this character creation screen is, for all intents and purposes, one of the few times you will ever see your character's face, and the only time you will see it with this much detail. Unlike other RPGs, all of your interactions are locked to the first person instead of a more cinematic shot reverse shot setup. So waste all the time you want sculpting your character all you want, but it doesn't really matter at all since the times you will see your character in death animations and idle pans, you're going to be wearing a helmet anyway. I'll have some more gripes about this later when we talk about dialogue, don't worry. Oh, we don't really need to get into the weeds here, but the other three major things you set up for your character are important. Attributes, skills, and perks. Attributes are broad-based stats that affect your starting skills. Skills we've already largely covered, but you can level them up in groups until they reach 50, at which point you can level them up individually beyond that up to 150. This system actually works pretty well because it reduces the traditional sweat-inducing overchoice that comes from managing a bunch of different skills. Thankfully, the game lays out what ranking up skills to hit certain thresholds actually means. As you play through the game, the drugs you use, the armor you're wearing, etc, etc, will actually affect these skills, so while playing, you'll see that whatever your actual modified skill is, is in parentheses off to the side. While I enjoyed the skill system, I was a little hard pressed to get much delight out of the perks, which are personal modifiers to a bunch of random stuff that you add every other level. These were much harder to pick through, especially as you unlock more tiers. Do I really want to be able to fast travel while encumbered, or do I want a better chance to critically hit while in combat? Do I want more XP anytime I... Well, yes, actually I do. On top of the dilemma of picking perks for yourself, you'll get to pick them for your six companions as they level up too. The more pertinent ones will involve, do they draw more or less aggro than you do in combat, or do they have a better chance of resetting their special combat ability after using it, which can make or break individual encounters. Unfortunately, you'll find no quirky Fallout-esque ones like a mysterious stranger that pops out of nowhere to finish off an enemy, or a bloody mess one that causes enemies to detonate in the most visceral fashion possible. The Outer Worlds also has an interesting take-it-or-leave-it system called Flaws. If you take damage in a particular way, or use particular drugs enough, you get the option to lose some base attribute stats in favor of another perk. You don't need to do this when it pops up, but you can, and it kind of mixes up gameplay a bit from whatever decisions you made way back when you rolled your character. I did accept flaws as they became available, from using Adreno to heal too often, too quickly, or by absorbing too many damaging N-rays, but the whole system just kind of seemed to disappear after the first third of my playtime. Disappointingly, the game's primary gameplay loop doesn't twist the formula in any meaningful way in the slightest. You arrive on a new planet slash rock in the sky, quickly find yourself in the settlement slash quest hub, load up on quests, wander into the darkness to kill six of these, meet with Jim Bob to learn the secret whatever, acquire the mystical MacGuffin, then return to the quest hub and cash in with the original quest givers, then do it again until you run out, move on to the next quest hub, and so forth. This is something we'll explore more in a second. The Outer Worlds really makes a big effort to teach you new things with screen stealing splashes, but sometimes I was left in the dark on different mechanics. One that stuck out to me at first was companion commands. I had a d-pad of requests for my AI helpers, but didn't quite understand how they worked. I eventually figured it out, especially as bumping up my leadership skills unlocked them, but when did the game teach me these? There are lots of little examples like this. And then, always the best advice, save often, save always. I touched on the shape and quality of the game's environments earlier, but there's really a lot to say about them. There's only one real overworld map in the whole game, so the rest of the places you visit are compartmentalized open spaces that host urban enclaves, aka settlements, and dungeons. Strung between them like Christmas lights are roads for robotic loaders to traverse, except you never see one in action, and smaller camps and settlements to bypass or plunder. 
Dotting these maps in some grid are pods of enemies, so no matter how you traverse these spaces, you're gonna run into bad guys at some point. It's weirder when enemies exist in areas you think were safe, like on the grounds of this hotel or in this tourist-friendly wilderness nearby. And the civvies posted around here don't seem to notice. Hmm. There are lots of beautiful details wherever you go. The skyboxes are gorgeous, with planets and moons typically hanging just above your head. The local flora is a sight to see, even if the fauna is pretty similar everywhere you go. The environmental artwork works well to tell stories, like the unkempt, muddy flooring when you're inside Edgewater, a Saltuna canning company town on the brink of collapse. The game likes to present a real functional world that these people live in, even if people don't seem to actually live in it or use its features. To that extent, the game is effectively anti-Star Trek in that it's more than happy to show you its bathrooms. More than happy. More, 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 more than happy. More than happy. More than happy. The computer terminals you encounter are clunky, monochrome CRTs and, uh, ripped almost entirely from Fallout's retro future. The computers themselves have lens flare for days. But I need to remind you that this is not an open world game by any means. This is far more Knights of the Old Republic than Skyrim, and as big as some of these planetary compartments get, there's just enough real estate here to make exploration feel organic, but also limited at the same time. A big complaint I had with Fallout 4, the uniform distribution of activities across the map instead of just letting wilderness be, you know, wilderness, crops up here. Years later in no clips behind the scenes footage of this game, Obsidian explains that this is the result of continual challenge to provide points of interest to drive player engagement. I'm sure there's plenty of data behind this approach and I can vouch for how cool it is to come across a dungeon or set piece on the way to your actual objective, but it seems slightly perverse to me to move a hundred feet in any direction and face a slot machine of dungeon, set piece, or group of enemies, or some combination thereof, because it feels so artificially dense and makes these places feel less plausible and more game-like and focus tested. I realize this isn't anything proprietary to the Outer Worlds, but this is the review where I'm realizing it, so this is the review where I'm going to bitch about it. I remember playing Battlefield 2 over 15 years ago and realizing how much more I enjoyed the Desert Combat mod for Battlefield 1942. The mod preserved the proportion of realistic spaces and made you feel like you had some freedom to sneak through the hillside and snipe someone from a quarter mile unseen. On the other hand, the AAA sequel shrunk maps and deliberately designed spaces to channel players into encounters over and over again, which felt artificial and limiting. Well, that's modern level design for you. Because of limitations with the engine, you're never going to see a crowd of characters on screen. I swear I voiced my disappointment about this in earlier reviews, and there's really two reasons why. First off, we were shown this was possible years ago in games like Cameo, which was an Xbox 360 launch title in 2005, and Kanan Lynch Dead Men and Assassin's Creed in 2007. But that all seems to have disappeared so games can focus their horsepower on other things, like existing. Obsidian explained to Noclip that more complex environments like the Groundbreaker space station required the game to remove entire slates of assets from memory when traversing distinct spaces. Characters and sound emitters had to be removed when out of view, simulations had to be cut off, etc, etc. Optimization is really a juggling act, but that brings me to my second reason. How do you portray a desperate space colony? Is it empty? I feel like video gaming leaves a lot on the table by not featuring crowds of desperate people that you need to move through to get between places. This population density doesn't seem to change regardless of where you're at, backwater or bourgeois. I kinda just wish that dystopia in video games wasn't pinned by technical limitations because, especially in a game like this where each character really needs to pull their weight to justify their existence virtually, they usually don't. If I'm walking by a crowd of people and I can't get the lore out of the entire Halcyon <laughs> system from any individual I talk to, that's fine. But when there's four people standing around this, you know, empty, prestigious promenade, expectations are a bit different. Most of the places you visit observe a day slash day as night cycle, so you get to experience the visual variety of sunrises, sunsets, and all of the fun stuff in between. Because of the day as night setting, you don't lose visibility in the dark because there is no actual real dark. 
Even caves are well lit. This means that, really, the time of day is more superficial than anything. Playing Skyrim at the same time reminded me that the Outer Worlds doesn't have a radiant AI style system that shuffles NPCs in and out of homes and to and from work on a schedule. Nah, everyone just kind of where they are always. While it would be easy to pin this on the AA budget and scope of the game, this is actually a limitation of the memory size on the older consoles that the game needs to run on. Now plausibly, if time never changes, you could explain away why the AI doesn't have schedules or lives. So then it becomes a question of what's weirder, a planet in which the sun never changes position, or a game in which the NPCs don't do anything except exist exactly where they were placed by a designer. Obviously, it's the former, so guess which one happens in the game. You'll find beds throughout the system to sleep in, but when you don't need to wait for a certain time of day for something to happen, it's almost entirely pointless except to remove status effects. Or maybe you're playing on supernova difficulty, which introduces fatigue that reduces your skills, and then you can only sleep in your bed on the unreliable. That's the only reason I can think of why these beds exist aside from bestowing realism, because I never once used the sleep mechanic. I do think it would be interesting if you had to use the bathrooms regularly though. Like, I got super mega shits in the middle of a conversation and I have to politely excuse myself to find the nearest bathroom? <laughs> God, Obsidian, where's my phone call? <laughs> the environments sometimes provide platforming opportunities to create interesting gameplay, like being able to access the top of a modular structure so you can take out this dude without having to come in through the front door. But it looks like there are a lot more opportunities to do this than there actually are though. There are plenty of times where you'll think you can clear an object like a desk, and you can't. Even though visually it <laughs> really looks like you should. The game does offer, well, not a double jump, but a jump and dash that's more for combat maneuverability than vertical world traversal. Then again, it's not like mounting a desk would actually affect the game or open gameplay or get you anywhere you needed to go or anything. But I did want to make the opposite argument for the lack of a jump in the 2014 Thief reboot, which you should check out too. There's never much verticality in this game, which makes the inclusion of fall damage a weird choice. While destinations within each world are rarely far from each other and there are rarely visible load junctures between them, fast travel between explored points even just to get back to your ship works extremely well and is extremely convenient. There is sort of an irritating thing when an objective marker is floating over one of these icons and you can't quite select it so that you can go there. I mean if you use a mouse you'll be fine but the controller does present issues. The maps of the Outer Worlds, aside from this niggling thing, a really blurry mip map thing on Eridanos, and only Eridanos in my experience, are really well rendered and stylish, incredibly clean and entirely useful, so props to Obsidian for those. The world does remind you of intentional limitations though. There are plenty of houses and buildings that are sealed up with eviction notices, but some are just sealed. It preserves the map asset budget while also piling on the hopelessness. There will be, from time to time, restricted areas that will be extremely hostile if you don't have the associated costume ready with your holographic shroud, which we'll talk about in a little bit when we get to stealth. Or you have this massive, wonderful Grand Colonial Tower with a penthouse suite, and the grandeur is significantly limited to a window view that only looks upward toward the sky because drawing the rest of the Eridanos facility in this penthouse would be too intense. The world is filled with gorgeous glistening detail like the facilities I mentioned on Gorgon, but also the hoity-toity interiors of Byzantium. I don't have a whole lot of experience in Art Nouveau styling, but you find it freaking everywhere, and it gives the world some visual cohesion. The ugly places will even get their own moment to shine as well. There are plenty of mundane moments where the world looks like it's full of boxes on lumpy terrain, but you know, it can't be eye candy all the time. Gameplay in the Outer Worlds is divided into three major systems. Dialogue, combat with stealth, and exploration with looting. We're going to break these down individually, but all three are in service of what we're actually doing in this game. Acquiring and completing quests. Role-playing games use quests, which are really just regimented tasks to facilitate storytelling, give weight and reasoning to conversations, justify combat beyond however fun it may be, and so on. Like other games, there are three tiers of these quests. The Golden Path is that main quest that propels you from beginning to end. It's the frame story and the entire premise of the game, and as I touched on earlier and will dive into in Chapter 4, 
it's extremely underwhelming. So what does The Outer Worlds do to keep you motivated to play, beyond its three major gameplay systems that you've already been familiar with from other games, and a really disappointing main quest? And you know, the hardcore hypercapitalist dystopia. Well, the game secondly gives you smaller, localized side quests. And all of a sudden, you're resolving a worker strike, or finding a worried mother's long-lost son, or finding life-saving medicine in an abandoned community center. For the most part, these quests will keep you in that general location, propelling you to explore and understand the local geography, and then, you know, bump into other characters and get their quests, and so on and so forth. We already talked about this. As you play through the game, you can recruit its six companions to join your party, help in combat, augment your skills, and inventory, and banter between each other. They also have their own quest lines, although the one for Sam, the cleaning mech, is short for those who want a light on narrative maintenance companion. These quests will typically take you between worlds, giving you plenty of reason to hop off if the local scene is getting old or irritating. The primary mechanic to keep you engaged with your companions is like Knights of the Old Republic nearly 20 years ago, and I'm sure it was a thing before then too, a gentle tugging from the game that a companion wants to talk to you about something. And so it goes. Hey, boss, I want to talk to you. Hey, boss, got a hypothetical for you? Playing a bunch of immersive sims lately, it felt natural that the Outer Worlds would offer multiple solutions to complete quests. The game's functional stealth and combat systems allow you to be stealthy and discreet, or loud and proud by default. But within the game's dungeons, you'll typically have even more options. This is because each dungeon will be littered with its own NPCs to question or kill, terminals to change things, quest items to pick up, and loot, loot, loot. Between all of these things, you'll typically get to craft your own recipe for victory or failure that will have its own consequences. Yes, I just realized I've described a role-playing game. Points for me. I don't know what it is, but in games like these, I typically find the terminals to shut down a dungeon security forces after I've gone through the pain and suffering of destroying them one by one. Every single one. Go figure. Another big example is how the Golden Path gets you to Cellar Bay on Monarch, and we'll get to that. What you'll discover often is that the quests can surprise you or try to obfuscate solutions. This guy Clyde, the head of a pirate gang, wants you to kill another guy, Trask, a traitor to the cause, and asks for the ring the traitor wears as proof. So right off the bat, we think two things. One, we can kill this guy to prove our loyalty, but two, we can probably not kill the traitor if he is in fact a traitor and just ask for his ring as proof. I found Trask and he explains that Clyde isn't actually some outlaw pirate shit talker, but a paid member or affiliate of the board. He's got proof back at the pirate base. You find the proof, show this to Clyde, and he's like, nah, and he tries to kill you. I'm sure there are a variety of other ways to complete this quest, and it's either going to be amusing to explore these options, or tired if you're used to these kinds of quests. Because of the nature of these side and companion quests, I often found myself, especially toward the end, fast traveling to every point on the particular world I was on just to turn in quests for hopping on my ship, zooming over to the next space rock and doing the same thing. Basically, the inverse of how I got the quests to begin with. I leveled up relatively quick this way, but it also felt very cheap and game-like design-wise. If you want a reminder that you're playing a video game, just, you know, make meaningful progress with the game's primary mechanic. Of course, this is also an issue because my desire to do a near-completionist run of the game meant stacking up as many of these quests as possible. Have you ever gone to a grocery store and bought every single box of donut sticks on the shelf for the sake of having a complete experience? It's kind of like that, but one is delicious and life-ruining and the other is just tedious gameplay. So now we get into the game's core gameplay, starting with dialogue. Of course you'd know about this playing any other Obsidian game, or RPG as well. It's the writing here that winds up pulling the most weight in the game, but it's also a star on its own. There are lots of bespoke NPCs that you'll get chatty with, far more than even I'm used to in an RPG. The conversations are even scripted and given conditions with proprietary software that Obsidian developed years ago, so it really is a special sauce that the developer slathers on to their role-playing burgers. And yet, after sessions playing this that were dialogue heavy, I often found that I was not thrilled about coming back to continue the journey versus sessions that were more about exploration or combat. Because talking can be fucking exhausting and boring. 
As far as gameplay goes, the dialogue system is relatively simple. You pick through conversations to try and sculpt the narrative, or get the information, or complete the quest, or whatever you need to get done. The only really exciting thing about this mechanically is that you'll get dialogue options based on skill checks. Heck, there was even an option with Felix based on my two-handed weapon skill. It's really freaking interesting at times, and while there are lots of these checks, I kind of wish the game leaned more in that direction. Then again, I was relatively relatively even with my skill point distribution, so I kind of always had access to all the dialogue options all the time. Again, there's nothing fancy or elaborate about these skill checks, your skill is either high enough or it's not. If you have companions with you, they'll inject what they think into the conversation, and it's usually very refreshing. It really is a marvel to see how much dialogue they had to write to get all of this functionality to work, to allow the illusion to work. They talk amongst themselves, having ongoing conversations as they move with you. They'll have conversations regardless of what combination of companions you have, and you'll realize pretty quickly that this is a huge number of configurations and stories. Where it gets bothersome at times is when the companions will inject themselves only to over-explain a situation and kill the tension. My favorite example of this came when I was investigating the whereabouts of a missing employee from the Stellar Bay Saltuna factory. I tracked him down to a house outside the gates of the city that's holed up pretty tight against the nasties that wander around the neighborhood. As soon as I step inside, I personally get weird vibes, but then both of my companions have to chime in about it. Like, I freaking get it, Nayoka and Ellie. I didn't need your help. Then the head of this family shows up and invites you to dinner. And the dinner was going to be you because it's a house of cannibals that you could see coming from a mile away, okay? If you're paying attention, information you receive during quest conversations can set you up for more options later on that will help you resolve a situation better and easier. There's a benefit to paying attention to conversations even if they can become information overloads. While you may be tempted to develop a particular style in these conversations to be snarky or to be mean, you'll find more often than not that regardless of how kind or cruel your choices are, you'll still wind up in the same place in the conversation either way. That said, you do get options if you push enough and have a high enough persuade slash intimidate slash lie skill, you can typically extort more from people for doing good for them. Since there's no morality system, the game's not going to shout you down as soon as the conversation ends for being a jerk ass. That's a relief. Like other games of this ilk, it can be very easy to bury yourself in the backstory of the world and its characters. Co-director Leonard Boyarsky said they effectively created multiple unseen tiers of dialogue as you talk with people. So you can skim the most important details from a conversation without feeling that you're missing out on too much. But you can also then dive really deep into the lore of just about any fucking thing you can possibly imagine. The thing is, the rabbit holes that exist in this game's conversations are a double edged sword. The most incredible moments I had here are the ones where the game easily presents the most tender stories, the most interesting character development, the most prolific characters. And it makes me want to seek out more information and hear more from them, and dig in deeper. And then the rest of the time, the game guided me into the depths of a bunch of crap that I did not care about in the slightest. Admittedly, I'm not a huge lore fan. If you like being explained 70 years of intergalactic corporate history and world building on a whim, there is definitely plenty for you here. And this applies to the countless terminals with emails you'll find around Halcyon 2. I kinda wish they color-coded the deep cuts, because I was rarely in the mood when I was between three quests, just needing the most important nugget of information, and I just needed to blow up some raptodons. I just got so freaking tired of reading stuff. And then some interesting things I found in the game wound up being unanswered questions, because the answer was buried in a conversation, or in an email, or what have you. And then there's the matter of, hey, I just want this conversation to end, in which you have to seek a deliberate exit among the dialogue options. In a game like Skyrim, which has been criticized for its simplified dialogue structures, you can just press B at any time and walk away. It's great. The other component of this system is what you're looking at, which is this other person's face. And they're good, not great, 
When I think about it though, they actually seem underwhelming considering how much importance this game places on conversational art. There's way too much chatting and way too much dialogue for motion capture performances, so it makes sense that the heavy lifting is scripted and automated. But it only takes a shit post featuring deep faked AI animation to see where this kind of technology can go, where it kinda already is, and how robotic these people look as a result. I mean, watch these conversations sped up and watch how little the characters change. Their heads rock back and forth, they look up and down, but their faces don't move or contort much, similar to a news anchor. Whether it's someone reacting to a terrible thing that happened or a wonderful date, they look largely the same. It'll also be interesting to see how all this goes because Obsidian is already working on powering AI in its future RPGs with AI voices coached by the actors themselves. It's going to get very fascinating very quick. Elsewhere, all the old people look like young people with some thin high school drama quality makeup and they sound like not old people. They can have dirty faces implying their hard work, but then they're always mocked with dirt. And in more private encounters, it's problematic? You'll find lots of people with beanies, lots of face models look similar, and that's to be expected. What you won't be expecting is how you enter some conversations, a maneuver that ranges from expected to animatronic nightmare, as NPCs leap up from their chairs with pre-baked Shatner lighting plastered to their faces. Even better, sometimes it doesn't pop on at all. Or it goes from 0 to 100 real quick from selecting the NPC to entering the dialogue window. Camera angles are modest, but it doesn't do nearly enough with this perspective. And then there's the robots. Simulating I mean, come on. Can you just hurry up and say the thing you need to say already? Since this is a hyper capitalist nightmare, it makes sense that the only way you're going to progress is to participate in the buying and selling nonsense that makes capitalists richer and everyone else more subjugated. There are vendors and merchants everywhere, but the Outer Worlds makes it even easier by planting vending machines in every place appropriate and seemingly inappropriate you can think of. They'll be plastered with corporate logos and artwork representing the consumer facing brands you'll begin to love and appreciate while dispensing relevant goods. Thankfully they'll all accept whatever you're selling, which will include the loads of junk you can pick up throughout the world. I really wish you could buy more than 50 rounds of each kind of ammo per vending machine, but I guess if there's a freaking row of them, and there usually are, then it's not really that big a deal. I mean look at this map of Fallbrook, look how many damn merchants there are. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous everywhere. This whole universe is ridiculous. You're ridiculous. I'm. There are also times when you see restricted stock of items that you can't buy and I couldn't quite figure out why. Maybe you can tell me in the comments because I mean maybe it was skill related? I don't know. It was only ever a handful of items. Oh and if you want to look at the in-game models like Skyrim style, you can. While we're talking about a hyper-capitalist dystopian nightmare, if we can hold up for a second and do all the fun stuff that's animating in the corner there to help this video's chances with the Destiny deciding algorithm, and hey, if you're enjoying this review so far, be sure to check out my Patreon so then I can make more of these quicker. They take three to five months to produce and I'd like to get more of them out to you guys so if, you know, you could help, hey, that'd be great, join the party. And if you can't, no bigs, enjoy the video. Oh, speaking of which. I never thought that combat in a role-playing game would be a highlight, but here we are. Yeah, that's a, that's a bit of a loaded statement, because compared to an actual shooter, this feels floaty, weird, and imprecise. So like any combat in any role-playing game. I kept drawing comparisons to Fallout 4 and how much better and tight combat felt there versus its Bethesda predecessors, or what I remember of how that felt. It's been a few years. There are some fun visceral bits here. Enemies vaporizing into a high energy state never gets old. Bodies can fly apart and explode into red clouds of enemy goo. A cinematic takedown concludes group battles because of course it does. But early on the combat definitely felt like an obligation and imprecise, but as time went on I warmed up to its mission. Holistically combined with the stealth mechanics, combat encounters can become puzzles that make solutions feel very satisfying. Weapons can dole out different kinds of damage that affect different enemies and you can modify weapons to deal different damage. 
What confused me about this through the moment I beat the game is that I never really understood how dispersing different kinds of damage, whether electrical, plasma, corrosive, or vanilla gunfire, affected different enemies. I mean, obviously, yes, you want to use electric damage on robots, but what about everything else? It was so satisfying to pick the weapon that melted right through opponents like butter, but that typically happened after a lot of guessing and testing, and usually a number of my own deaths. You can equip up to four weapons at a time, and maybe there's a quirk with using this controller, but sometimes I couldn't move weapons out of the portfolio to replace them with something else. It felt random, weird, and arbitrary, but ultimately not a big deal. Out in the field, you use the weapon wheel to switch between weapons, but similar to my complaints about loot, the weapon wheel doesn't describe what any weapon is, what damage it does, provide a name, highlight its DPS, or anything. As you work through the game, you realize how many weapons use the same artwork, and that's all the weapon wheel shows off. I hope you planned your weapon wheel portfolio well, and remember what each weapon is. Tactical time dilation is the Outer Worlds slow motion crutch. Like VATS in the Bethesda Fallout games, it feels like a tool to let controller players like me participate in combat and not get repeatedly wiped. It also allows you to take advantage of enemy weak points with the controller as well. Mechanicals got a weak spot in their midsections. I think the technical term is, um, the blue glowy square thing. One bad habit I never seemed to shake, however, was dumping a clip into an enemy, or near an enemy, and then dropping into TTD right as I needed to reload, which left me vulnerable and wasted, you know, slow down time juice. Let's talk about weapons, because they're your tools here and you have quite a few of them and quite a few skills to support them, but please don't expect anything revolutionary. Up close, your melee weapons are tempting, even if you can get an elbow in toting anything else. I'm coming off a quartet of games in which the blackjack was my favorite tool, so expectations were high. The game's in-game advertisements portray these blades like they're meaty lightsabers. Unfortunately, while melee works, it feels weird. Blades just pass through enemies rather than connecting. Enemies have little response to your swings. I really wanted to be a melee player early on, but I felt vulnerable against enemies with mid-range attacks, which was most of them. And apparently I missed out on some cool weapons and moments because of this. Along with science weapons like the Spectrum Gatling Gun or the Shrink Ray, DPS ratings for melee weapons are really low, so it felt like I was leaving pain on the table by using them. You can also charge your attacks for, you know, quote unquote massive damage. Despite the game's gore, you can't mutilate bodies with these weapons, but uh, that's probably okay. In the mid-range, you have pretty much all of the game's weapons. Shotguns, rifles, spray and pray machine guns, flamethrowers, these work exactly as you expect. The flamethrowers and energy cannons, like the melee weapons, don't feel like they connect with enemies, so feedback isn't great here either. At a distance, you can add a scope to pretty much anything and get a long range weapon, but at long range, the grenade launcher was a favorite because the game doesn't offer grenades or other throwables. In that same vein, I wish you could plant the very same traps and mines that you encounter throughout the game to take down enemies while you're kiting them in retreat. But then, as we all know, mind you set will typically blow you up as well. At the same time, there's rarely an advantage to launching a surprise attack on a pod of baddies unless you're deep in one of the game's more difficult combat puzzles and underleveled. And yeah, you can modify your weapons. They'll fatigue over time and be less effective, so you'll have to repair them periodically using weapon parts, which you'll find everywhere. There are tons of modifications you can slap on these things to, again, change their damage type, but also add scopes, increase long range range effectiveness, magazine sizes, and so on. And then you can tinker and level up your tools of destruction to deliver even more damage with a price that hikes up exponentially with each upgrade up to five levels beyond your character's level. So you'll wind up with a few favorite guns and then find plenty scattered throughout the world to either break down into weapon parts to fix up the weapons you have or to just sell outright. Your armor, however, is relatively simple. You have a chest piece slot and you have a helmet. You can even pick up fancy hats. You can wear standard ass clothing, but you're obviously not gonna get a lot of armor rating out of it. There's a dream where I could craft a really cool looking outfit, but then you're not gonna see it on your figure hardly ever anyway. Like weapon parts, you'll find armor parts everywhere to fix your armor as it degrades and you know what I'm talking about. And then you have your companions. Again, you can have up to two companions with you at any time. 
Now you don't actually need to have companions. There are perks that assist you whether flying solo or as a group. Each companion will have different skills and you can set their broad responses and behaviors for combat. I eventually just set them all to aggressive because early on I realized they would literally just stand around staring at you while you were being shot up by enemies. But this worked in my favor anyway because then they required less management and less anxiety over their controls which the game doesn't really explain well. Up is attack but if your companions are set to aggressive they're gonna attack automatically anyway. Down directs you to wherever you point your reticle at, a command I never used, but left and right are reserved for their special cinematic high damage abilities that you unlock as you boost your leadership skills. You can and must set your companions weapons and armor manually, otherwise they'll ride with you using the same flimsy stuff they join you with. What really irked me about their armor in particular is twofold. Their helmets ensure that you can't see who's talking to you or who exactly is who, although their helmets do pop off when you're in conversation anyway then also, pop right back on tired. as you leave. I really wish they had globe or glass helmets or something so you could see who was who at any time without sacrificing their armor rating by not wearing a helmet at all. And then there were times I thought one companion was talking when it was actually the other one. Awkward. Secondly, since the armor you give them is the same stuff you pick up, you'll find that your companions tend to look like your opponents. And it's just frustrating when allies will often look like enemies anyway. On the plus side, you can pick up some cool armor sets that, combined with the game's high-level machine guns, make them look like power-armored troops from the Fallout games. Fighting alongside you, companions are genuinely really useful, and their abilities can make or break a battle. If you're playing anything other than Supernova difficulty, they can be killed, but resurrect when a conflict is over and will regenerate their health so you don't need to babysit them with inhalers. Speaking of which, let's talk about healing, the kind we all want. You know with an inhaler. My left bumper summoned the inhaler, which by default dispenses Adreno, your healing agent. It's not instantaneous, it's not a huge chunk of your health, but that's how you do it. You can swap out what chemical goes in your inhaler or equip a cocktail of chemicals with various status effects, with more slots that open as you boost your medical skill. This is something I didn't understand until well after I'd beaten the game, but had accidentally used anyway, so uh... <laughs> <laughs> Adding to my confusion is like this fucking smorgasbord of crap that gradually accumulates in your medical tab. I mean, look at all this junk, all these creams, all these drugs. Some even do the same thing. It's freaking weird. And then we get to the enemies, and I'm here to report that I have little to report. There are humans, drug-enhanced psychohumans, reptiles, robots, and giant mantises and primals. And they're everywhere, across all of the worlds you visit, as if they stowed away on ships hurtling amongst the cosmos. And that's it. What I really want to talk about now are the game's stealth mechanics. I'm glad the combat is at least competent and usually enjoyable because otherwise any ability to subvert it would either be completely necessary or completely trash. Or both. Stealth in the outer worlds works. It works. The tension to avoid combat before you've appropriately leveled or equipped or skilled up is there. To activate stealth, you just crouch. How intuitive, right? The game does this fun thing where your companions will join you and begin whispering to you instead. The feedback is amazing. In the field you encounter cover grass, which are patches of world to hide in and the game will reduce its opacity so that you can look out beyond it and strategize. It's very pretty, especially on Gorgon. Enemies, similar to the Thief reboot, will have visible threat meters indicating how much attention you're drawing while slinking around. Another thing that attracted me to melee weapons early on coming off the Thief games was the want for a tool to deliver instant stealthy takedowns. But the thing is, your enemies are not static targets and your weapons don't have static stats. If the melee weapon you're using can dole out more damage than the enemy has health, it creates this this illusion that you have an instant takedown blackjack style ability to disable enemies. Well, the human ones anyways. But this is kind of elusive. There were times when I tried a stealthy takedown and the enemy took the hit, shook it off, and then pumped me full of ammunition. While save scumming was the most important component to combat or stealth, what actually enhanced the experience in the outer worlds was bumping up the difficulty. Yes. Mr. Not Very Good at Video Games Nth Review actually boosted the challenge of the game before hopping in because of all the anecdotes I'd read when it came out that the lower difficulties were a cakewalk. And I didn't want a cakewalk, so I set it for hard. And I tell you what, I 
this damn game on hard, and I am not the very best at this stuff. The difficulty really enforces the importance of making stealth routine while keeping you on top of your character and companion's abilities, armor, and weaponry. It makes the combat feel meaningful, even essential, and it forces you to examine and understand the game's systems and tools in order to succeed. The next step beyond the hard difficulty is the game's supernova difficulty, which is comparable to the hardcore mode of Obsidian's Fallout New Vegas. It doesn't really feel like a higher difficulty, it seems like a different game entirely. It's not a fish for me, but I can totally see who would be into that. I would totally try it out on a second run though. One last thing I want to touch on is a stealth adjacent mechanic called the Holographic Shroud. Phineas introduces it once you get off Terra 2 and makes it sound a lot cooler than it is because it's underdesigned and underutilized. It's such an interesting idea. What you do in very particular sections of this game is download costumes. With these costumes you can access restricted areas nearby because the costumes are usually right next to where you would use them and the holographic shroud will create a holographic shroud to disguise you and your companions. So you can wander around these spaces with some interesting restrictions. It's easy to understand. If you were wearing a complex, emanating, light-based costume in the real world, it would have some trouble maintaining the illusion as you moved, and the projector had to constantly recalculate and change the projection, raising the suspicion of anyone nearby. And then if you got too close to someone, they could see right through it. So as you move, the holographic shroud depletes. When the meter runs out, someone will typically confront you at which point you can usually just speech check your way back to authenticity and reset your shroud meter. The holographic shroud is an interesting idea in search of more... well, just more. Its usage here feels flimsy, primarily because of how rarely you'll use it. You can't change when, where, or how the shroud is used. You simply have the costume you need, and it automatically deploys when the game needs it to. It's auto-stealth. This reduces confusion in how it's used, but it also just, again, it doesn't feel very substantial. How cool would it be to, say, discreetly scan a highly placed NPC and then impersonate them for a quest? This would open an entire avenue of gameplay. In my experience with how I played, the Shroud was a mandatory mechanic to complete several important quests, which allows it to avoid obscurity entirely. And if you're ghost running the game, it's going to be part of the experience regardless. There is some AAA version of this game where the Shroud is the coolest mechanic in the talk of the town, but then there's probably an entire game that could be built out of this mechanic too. Just saying, game developers, Obsidian. Lock picking and hacking are probably the most interesting mechanics of any role playing game for me. I like stealing and taking things that aren't mine in these doing? games. I like recruiting computers and electronic systems to, well, shut themselves off or open doors or work against my enemies. So in a science fiction role playing game like The Outer Worlds, you're naturally going to have both, but here they're perfunctory. Hacking needs bypass shunts that are distributed so often that they may as well not even be required. The virtual CRT interfaces will often require the virtual screen to warm up, so you'll find they're pretty dim and sometimes hard to read because the text ghosts as you scroll. Similarly, you pick locks with lockpicks that look like flying saucers, and I don't think I ever ran out beyond the first act. Using these skills beyond having the tools in your inventory is just a simple check. You've either bumped up your skill to the required level, or you haven't. There aren't any mini games to get through or skill involved from the player's end, you just can or you can't. Artificial intelligence here is also... Like so many other games over the past couple decades, NPCs here are rarely more than information kiosks or performers of stilted, random conversations to start quests or whatever. Even the combatants don't seem to care about anything going on beyond their 20-foot awareness cylinder or just beyond the walls of whatever room they're standing in. I mean, come on, we saw more interesting enemy behavior in Thief in the 90s. In a line of thinking that seems to go back to the original Fallout, The Outer Worlds doesn't feature a morality or karma-based system, only consequences. The game doesn't sit there and browbeat you with how that thing you did was actually really good or really bad. It grants subjectivity to your actions, where one option is six and the other is half a dozen. There's clearly a do we side with the privileged or the disadvantaged through line here. Still, you can gain positive and negative reputation with the game's various factions. Not just one or the other, but both at the same time. On one end, this grants you discounts with merchants. On the other, well, they're just they're going to shoot you on sight. 
But to help playability, the game informs you, you can skip town for a while and they'll just forget about the bad stuff you did. What's interesting about playing a bunch of older games and then a modern game is seeing how little the needle has moved in terms of gameplay. I get that Obsidian didn't have a huge budget. I get that they prioritized world building and the story and the characters we're about to talk about, but so far, it's hard to shake the reality of the Outer Worlds as this bog standard game, adhering to a strict old template. And as I've pointed out, the things they bring to the mechanics table are imaginative, but don't get enough time or notice or thought. It's frustrating to play this as a game and not compare it to other games that are more innovative and released years earlier. Again, it's like Tim and Leonard went back 15 to 20 years in terms of design philosophy and features and started building their game from there, ignoring so much about how role-playing games and shooters have evolved since then. Combine this with the necessity to use as much off-the-shelf technology as possible and you wind up with a game that looks like 2019 but plays like the mid-aughts. And the road only gets bumpier from here. It really does gleam like spit shine gold. Just imagine busting up all these windows, looting all these stores. The worlds of the Outer Worlds are filled with tales of adventure. Not just the ones these characters lived through, but the fictional ones that populate the dramas that entertain the underclass. One recurring complaint I hear about the companions in this game is that they're underwhelming. Your robot companion isn't some human-hating maniac. The pals that join your party through the game don't whip out quippy one-liners with every conversation. Except Felix, the dumbass. They are not action stars. Only one has a legendary reputation, but they never play it up. They're remarkably normal for living in such a fantastic universe, and I think that's what turns people off. This is far less Forrest Gumpian characters threading their way through every important event in the universe, and far more Wonder Years-like exploration of what happens in the burbs. In the worlds of Halcyon, where the dystopia is something that is crushingly personal, having realistic partiers with you really sells the mundane, creeping horror of it all, and each companion brings something different to the exploration of it. Another important distinction of the Outer Worlds Companion, something you already know because you haven't heard of it, is the lack of a romantic option. There will be no building romance scores with various partiers in hope of eventually getting to... the stuff. Obsidian says they didn't want to include them because they were hard to do, but I think when you consider the typical gamer, romantic yeah. options can very quickly reduce your companions to little more than glorified walkthroughs to the stuff. I realize we're all thirsty gamers here, but not every companion needs to be a power aid, right? Right? You also have the option, should you choose to select it, to not accept any companions at all. If you do take them in, you can boot them at your own pleasure. You can even make some big decisions in this game that will make them want to leave. But I'm not a big meanie head, so I didn't do these mean things. I present to you the companions of the Outer Worlds. Youthful naivete is what Parvati brings to the table as a mechanic in Edgewater Saltuna Factory. Assigned to you by your bowler-wearing boss to get the power regulator you need to get off Terra 2, Parvati immediately apologizes about anything and everything. Sorry, I... you just want to get out of here. There's more to it all than numbers. Sorry. She explains to him the issues of stuffing a bunch of non-Saltuna into cans that are specifically designed and marketed as Saltuna, which are destroying their machines. When you get to leave Terra 2, she cautiously asks to join you on adventures she's only heard about in Aetherwave shows. All she's ever known is that rotting company town, and even if she's never fixed a spaceship per se, both of you know she really could help out. Parvati was born and raised into the system of permanent employment and oppression. Her mother was whisked away by Spacer's choice and her father was worked to death. And yet she'll still defend the company's policies. She's an innocent soul, anthropomorphizing the machine she works with. Be more careful out there, Jeremy. She struggled to maintain relationships because she's asexual and just not interested in the physical aspect. This makes her quest to win over Junlei Tennyson, the leader and chief mechanic of the Groundbreaker, so genuinely sweet. From the does she or doesn't she emails back and forth, to the fetch quest to acquire rare items for their first date, to the first date itself, and her falling head over heels in love, it's the game's most genuinely touching and human experience. 
Parvati is voiced by Ashley Birch, who's brought a number of other wonderful video game characters to life, and she's perfect for conveying Parvati's sweetness and optimism. Just an observation, in combat she's incredibly good with a gun, to the extent that she performs like every other psychopathic murderer out there. But in a character moment on The Unreliable, she flinches while practicing with Nyoka. Huh. Vicar Max is Edgewater's holy man and he brings the game's thoughts on religion to the game. Now I know what you're thinking, but hang with me because it's a lot simpler than it comes across. Max is a preacher man with an interesting past. He left to join the game's church, the Order of Scientific Inquiry, to seek the happiness he thought his parents had because they were adherents of scientism. Religion in the Outer Worlds boils down to two schools, scientism and philosophism, or order and chaos boiled down further. Throughout Halcyon, you'll hear people talk about the law. Law forbid, law bless, thank the law. Scientism is a deistic religion, like the faith of late Enlightenment thinkers and the American founding fathers like Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and Benjamin Franklin. In deism, a grand architect set the universe in motion, established its rules like physics, and then just disappeared, didn't intervene. So everything in scientism is preordained and fated and merely a matter of having enough information to determine cause and effect. That's the law these people are talking about, the rules that govern the universe. Philosophism takes on more Eastern existential themes. Everything is based on chaos. Your job is just to exist, to ride the wave, to experience life and interpret it for yourself rather than trying to figure out the simulation some grand architect set up a forever ago. As the vicar of OSI, Max is clearly struggling to figure out the architect's plan and seeking out a forbidden text that will help him along the way. He's a man hungry for answers, but scientism hasn't proved satisfying enough for his craving, and his flaring temper as he bumps into disappointment reflects this. Max's questline brings him to Monarch, and then eventually the home of a hermit, where he takes strange drugs and experiences ego death. Max's arc really resonated with me as someone who converted out of religion to deism, and then to agnostic atheism. Obviously, everyone's religious experience is different, and this one in particular had to fit within the scale of a handful of quests that you would honestly get more out of if you had dug into Max's lower level conversations, but that's true of all of these companions. I imagine Max's story would be harder to understand if your experience was different personally, though. We meet Ellie on Groundbreaker and her story is about emancipation, of cutting ties to the family and making life your own. She is an adventure-seeking surgeon who leaves behind her cushy upbringing on Byzantium. She's not a touchy-feely lady either, and she lets you know this when awkwardly inviting you to her parents' upper-crust mansion. She just wants you to come across as a brutal, wild person, you know, the company she keeps now, but to her parents. Not weird at all. But when you meet her parents, and you can play along with Ellie or not, you find out that they have really benefited from Ellie vanishing into the ether by having her declared dead and cashing in on her insurance money. Naturally, I worked with Ellie to reroute that money to a fake beneficiary that would benefit her from her own death. When we meet Felix, he's justifying some stupid act of violence involving a toss ball racket that puts him in hot water with both the board and the independent operators on Groundbreaker. Naturally, he's looking for a job now. He's arrogant, immature, he's a bro. He chips in stupid jokes at inopportune times to elicit a laugh that usually doesn't come. Sounds like my old job. I had all these bang up ideas, you know? Like making everybody haul their own damn boxes. Never did catch on though. And when they make a movie version of this, this is definitely a perfect role for Andy Samberg. We talked about his quest line with Clyde earlier about how this guy he knew was a fraud, and that's a pretty tough reality pill for him to swallow. He has to cope with the fact that the universe is not always as he shapes it, and is not always as carefree as he thinks it is. We've already talked about Sam, you get it, he's a cleaning robot who's been modified to kill, it's great. Finally, Nyoka, a lesson about loss and making the best of a terrible world. Nyoka is a legendary huntress on Monarch, and you'll find her at the bar regaling patrons with stories from the sulfur pits. A little bastard slippery, right? On account of its blood, so it's, it's sliding all over the place, trying to crawl away. You help her out of her hangover and she asks to help lay her former companions to rest. Nyoka was part of a group at a point, seven of them, and they thought they had a handle on surviving the hostility of Monarch, a hostility that forced the board to condemn the whole planet as a hazard. Nyoka's group found a cave and began building a hideout. They began to better themselves and claim a corner of this world all their own. 
But one by one they failed, and Nyoko watched them die. They thought they were getting ahead, but Monarch just kept clawing for them, dragging them to oblivion. You work with Nyoka to collect their medallions, the ones they created just for their outfit, Kron, an acronym for each of their names, Nyoka at the end. At a point you discover that two of them left for Terra 2 to clear an expansion site for Spacer's Choice. You find them only to discover they've taken their own lives in the face of ceaseless marauder attacks. A last minute note reveals that leaving Monarch wasn't about the money. These two just wanted off Monarch. They valued their lives and left, then still lost their lives anyway. Eventually you get to visit Kron's would-be cave home and clear it from its manty infestation. You work with Nyoka to find the closure in her trauma she's faced and submerged in alcohol for so long. I really grew to appreciate not just her, but all of my companions and how they deal with their secret pains, coping in the ways they know how, which may not always be the healthiest or the best. Your companions reveal the trauma that this hyperclassist universe creates. It's far beyond having and not having. It's how having and not having affects you deeply, how it affects your health, your standing, your worldview, your strengths and your weaknesses, the people you know and call family. It's about never had and never will and the futility of a system that doesn't care that you or any human exists and the deep driving pains it creates in people and families that can't be healed. And you know, except for Sam, you can feel it in these companions. So maybe they're not the best characters with the most caricatured agendas, but they feel a lot more like people than any game I've played. And that's how I'll remember them when I've forgotten so many celebrated cartoons. So now we circle back to you, the player character. We've already talked about how you, you are, are no, no one, one, but the game does actually give you a name beyond the one you type into this game. You are the stranger. As you begin to affect Halcyon in bigger and bigger ways, you become this monolithic force who receives calls from higher and higher perches of power. Strangely, despite their immense resources, the board wasn't able to retrieve any records about who you were pre-skip. My only explanation is that they wrote off the hope entirely and all those records were deleted. But again, who are you beyond the moment-to-moment -moment inputs you send into the game? The Outer Worlds gives you just a peek at what your life was like before hopping onto the Hope colony ship and setting sail for the Halcyon system. In the character creation screen, you get to pick an aptitude, which is the job you once had, and it tweaks one of your stats in a minor way. These are mundane, entry-level jobs that look identical to what you could acquire in Halcyon 70 years later, like being a dirt farmer, a level zero bureaucrat, or an elevator operator. This also says a lot about innovative stagnancy under this hyper-capitalist system. But that's it. That's all you get. And the thing is, when you factor in how much you learn about your companions and NPCs throughout Halcyon with the dialogue system, I began to wonder, hey, why aren't they asking me who I am? I mean, they do, at least in the earliest parts of the game. But when you explain that you've just been thawed by a mad scientist from a long-lost colony ship, the most you get in response is... Ugh, is this the start of a joke? If you want me to laugh at your jokes, it's a three drink minimum. Based on the conversations you can have, the stranger seems more grounded and less weirded out about this strange universe he's woken up into than the people who actually live here. I dreamt, and I realize this is a big dream, why can't you create your own backstory through conversation? Why can't you have opinions about being a dirt farmer or an elevator operator? Why can't you use that to sculpt your reputation with various factions and inspire people to do things as you move through the game as the stranger? Something like that would add to your agency far beyond shooting mantis or passing persuasion checks with people you don't know. As your reputation grows through the game, people understand who you become as the captain of the unreliable skating across Halcyon, causing big things to happen. But the game never really cashes in on this. Even in the outro cutscene, you are still this nameless figure, this player cursor given form in this reality clicking on things. You become this generic savior figure by the end, and then that's kinda silly and cliche on its own, but it also feels unearned, despite however many hours it took you to become it. They don't even show the face that you spent all that time sculpting at the beginning of the game. They don't even show your face. BioWare pulled this off nearly 20 years ago with the Revan reveal that used the face you selected in Knights of the Old Republic. The Outer Worlds, even in its final moments, still doesn't know who you are. <sighs> 
Anyway, let's talk about Halcyon. But before we do, I need to let you know that this is not going to be an exhaustive overview because that's just boring. Everyone's got their favorite quests and character moments in here, but this is going to be a more of a glimpse at these worlds and a highlight of the game's story beats. It also reflects the decisions I made, and your story will, of course, be different if you make different decisions. I mean, right? Right, right, right. The game isn't split into acts, but this first segment in Emerald Vale really feels like the first one. You arrive on Terra 2 and are guided through a narrow canyon tutorial section that gives you all the basic mechanics you need to get going. Oh by the way, you literally landed on Alex Hawthorne, the smuggler you were supposed to meet to help Phineas. So when you arrive at his ship, the Unreliable, you have to convince the onboard computer, Ada, that you are the new captain of the ship. Unfortunately, you can't leave with the Unreliable until you get a power regulator. So now you have to go into town and get one. Edgewater is a spacer's choice town that's rotting away and its people are just... It's just bad here. Nothing about this place feels good. The best part about Edgewater is finding this model of the town in an exhibit on Gorgon and then hopping on top of it. That's cool. While trying to navigate this enclave, a sense of vast overwhelming anxiety slid over me, similar to what happens in so many other RPGs. Here are all these people, with all this dialogue, and all this lore, and all these stories, and all this stuff that I have to learn, and then I have all this stuff to explore, like, where do I even start? Well, you start with the first step, I guess. Edgewater's boss says that you can have a power regulator, but not theirs. There's a camp of dissenters at the old botanical lab up the way. They have one. You can take theirs after you divert all of the local power plant's juice to this town. Emerald Vale is a hilly area with rock column formations that look like something out of that Halo Infinite reveal that no one liked. Paths take you where you need to go pretty directly, but there are marauder camps and abandoned Spacer's Choice facilities everywhere. The Botanical Lab serves as the home of those who are booted from Edgewater for not being good employees. It looks like paradise in comparison to the company town, and they've got a good scene here. Their leader, Adelaide, challenges you to divert the geothermal plant's power to them instead. Take their power regulator and let Edgewater just rot away. So you get to make your first big adult choice in the game when you reach the geothermal plant, after you knock out a bunch of robots and deal with the mechanic who's stuck down here. Because I figured the people of Edgewater would eventually figure out how to survive should Spacer's Choice abandon the town, I went against Parvati's last minute appeal and diverted the power to the Botanical Lab. I confronted Boulder Boss in his shutdown Saltuna factory and took the power regulator. With the Unreliable ready, it's time to get off-world. Like the Ebonhawk or the Normandy, the Unreliable is your yacht among the stars. Ada keeps you up to date on what's going on and intercepts incoming transmissions just across from the galaxy map terminal where you plot your destination. Your quarters are up on top in the ship's forehead and grant you a wonderful panoramic view of whatever system or facility you're orbiting. As you progress, you acquire bespoke items and trinkets and even a tiny little canid. Isn't he adorable? Further back are the crew cabins that fill up as your party does, and then the kitchen, the engine room, and then back down to the cargo bay. Now this is the outer world and not privateer, so while I started dreaming big about a cargo bay full of goods to run between worlds after the parcel delivery that begins peril on Gorgon, I kept my expectations in line. So uh, where's that new Sundog or uh, privateer space trading game, guys? The Unreliable is your vessel for getting between worlds, but to be honest, I didn't spend a whole lot of time in here because functionally, outside of the personal workbench or the ability to push companion quests forward, there's not a whole lot to do. But the game's first act in Emerald Veil kind of trained me on how to experience the game. You see, the Golden Path rarely requires you to backtrack, featuring one primary objective in each area. Without much issue, you can work each world or zone individually, completing all the local side quests, and then never return, reinforcing the idea, after spending roughly six and a half hours in Emerald Vale, to just get everything done before moving on. As a result, it doesn't really feel like you get your mileage out of the ship unless you get into the companion quests or until you begin Peril on Gorgon, which wisely bounces you around. It really highlights how much thought went into the DLC versus the rushed main story. Your first destination is the Groundbreaker Station, and it feels like you're at the beginning of the game's second act. Earth originally sent those two colony ships to Halcyon, the Groundbreaker and the Hope. 
The Groundbreaker made it, but the hope came out of faster-than-light travel too early and drifted in space for most of a century before Phineas decided to revive you. When you get to board the hope in the third act, you will get to uncover a whole bunch of just truly evil stuff that happened there. Anyway, that evil stuff didn't really happen on Groundbreaker, and the massive ship has been converted into a space station, an independent harbor out of the reach of the board, although they maintain an office here. There's also a massive, beautiful promenade dressed in bright signs that provides a stark contrast to the mud hole you were just in. Master Mechanic and Parvati's future love interest, Junlei Tennyson, runs the place. You get to help her resolve a number of issues with the station, like the fact that the radiator is busted and it's really hot. Although it's not really conveyed too well beyond occasional comments from NPCs. There's also a madman in the basement to take care of. What you're really here for though is a nav key to land in Stellar Bay on Monarch, and Gladys, just the nicest merchant on the station, is more than happy to sell you one. For a lot of money. So you gotta get that. And that involves completing a smattering of side quests that give you some chances to hop off world. Scylla is an asteroid that became known internally as the Rock to Dump Off Quests because the Golden Path never takes you there. Both Max and Felix's companion quests bring you here. There's a terraformer here and some energy fencing to maintain a stable atmosphere because it's easier to mine for rare metals without a big bulky environment suit. The only problem is that they didn't find anything valuable on this rock so they abandoned it. There are a lot of enemies here for being such a small mining pit, but it does give you the opportunity to save Captain Erion, a Zap Brannigan-like. And then there are these strange... columns again, huh? Responding to a distress call kicks off your journey to Roseway, another Emerald Vale-style open area on Terra 2 to explore. The wilderness has become unruly here, forcing the guard of Roseway to seal off the Auntie Cleo pharmaceutical enclave here and cutting off scientists from their experiments. This sets you up to clean up the perimeter of Raptodons and Marauders and then raid the abandoned lab dungeons to the south. If you manage to snag some corporate secrets during your travels, Gladys will happily pay you for them. I ended up helping the individual Roseway scientists instead completely accidentally, so I had nothing for Gladys when I came back to turn in my quests. She seemed nonplussed about it. Bless your slippery little fingers. Isn't that just a shame? So while there aren't any level-gated areas in the Outer Worlds, landing on Monarch before I had my Stellar Bay nav key was, uh, it was a struggle. I mean, the landing tag says, warning, this place is really dangerous, but I'm a persistent person. Apparently the quest to get to Stellar Bay by purchase or hostility proved to be a very complex task for the Obsidian team. At any rate, I landed in the abandoned Rizzo's company town of Cascadia at level 11. It handled the nasties in town just fine. But once I stepped out onto the road, I met my demise very quickly. I'm sure there's some combination of weapons and skills that would get me through here, but eventually I gave up. I just gave up. I came back at level 15 after clearing out Roseway on Terra 2 and met the same fate. It wasn't until I'd purchased that nav key and completed a whole bunch of quests did I finally conquer those Manta Queens at level 21. Told you I'd get there eventually. Monarch is the game's largest world, which is interesting when you consider it has the largest object of any destination in Halcyon consuming its sky, the gas giant Olympus. This moon is tidally locked to the planet, meaning it has hot and cold poles. Not that it matters too much as far as the game is concerned, but it's a fun bit of lore. Okay, I thought it was interesting. Needing to spend so much money for Gladys' last Stellar Bay nav key is the result of the board barricading the planet as a hazard zone. Remember, we colonized Terra 1 first, we screwed up, made the wildlife super hostile, and made things super bad. And yet, there are plenty of human settlements that fringe Monarch's wilderness. This is Monarch Stellar Industries versus Iconoclasts, Sanjar versus Graham, Wonder. Dreary Saltuna Capital Stellar Bay versus Hillside Getaway Amber Heights. And then there's the previously mentioned Cascadia, which is a common quest destination. Devil's Peak, where you run into the broker to broadcast information, and Fallbrook, a town excavated out of a hillside by sublight. But sometimes you get tired of dealing with people and politics and lore, and Monarch gives you that empty space between it all to do, well, stuff. Like, survive, primarily. Again, you'll never feel like you can get lost here because there's always a sign or a road or a facility with an eyesight, but compared to the tidier, more controlled areas you visit in Halcyon, Monarch is a gem. There are a lot of stories here. You will also find plenty of death here. 
Dioka's quests? Yes, absolutely. Your deaths? Yes, absolutely. But so many of this moon's fibers are narratives of rose-tinted nostalgia, lost companions, and cold friends. There's even a sissy pig farm you can take over for sub-like. Oink! Sanjar is a bureaucrat who wants you to fetch obscure paperwork to get MSI back on the board to open the planet to commerce again. Graham wants... not that. His pursuits are a bit more... uh... vague and philosophical. Both want what they feel is best for Monarch, but both also once served MSI. When you clear the Marauders from the Broker's broadcast tower, he needs you to convince the two leaders to stop their endless airwave spamming so he can communicate with Phineas. That's how you'll find out where to acquire the chemicals he needs to revive the rest of the Hope's frozen passengers. Once you get through to Phineas, a UDL ship falls out of the sky, and both Sanjar and Graham plead with you to deliver them the ship's targeting module, putting you in a kingmaker position. I wound up siding with Graham because, well, philosophically, Sanjar sat in the same middle management league as Bowler Boss and Edgewater, and that just irritated me. But what followed was very surprising. Graham wants Stellar Bay, and so you'll march alongside the Iconoclasts from Amber Heights, killing dozens of MSI troops along the way. I did wind up killing a couple Iconoclasts too, because they kind of look the same as the bad guys. Arriving at Stellar Bay, I couldn't find Sanjar. When I talked to Graham back at Iconoclast HQ, he said that Sanjar had been killed. This felt very, very odd and dramatically unearned, because up to that point, it had been a cold war of words and ideas between them. Unseating Cellar Bay is a very exciting sequence, probably the most exciting sequence in the game, and it just, just feels arbitrary. If you told me there was originally a more of a structured ramp to this action earlier in development, and it had to be axed to get the game out the door, I'd believe it. This is definitely a weird and thinly boned conclusion to Monarch's story, and it only gets weirder and more insubstantial from here. Unfortunately, if you didn't own any of the DLC at this point, the game tumbles down a cliff for its haphazard third act. Some people say this game opens strong and ends weak. Some say this game opens weak and ends strong. But what I'm telling you right now is that this is the perfect place to insert the game's two DLC episodes. Now, I know what you may be thinking, because it's definitely what I thought going into this game knowing what I knew about this game. They should have spent their post-release development money making the third act better. Get more bones and tendons in there, or Botox it up, maybe. And that's an interesting proposal if Obsidian were using their own resources to just gradually add content and make the game better in a way that Hello Games did with No Man's Sky, or what Bethesda's trying to do with Fallout 76. I mean, you can't really make a this is the way the game should have ended DLC because that seems very problematic for far too many logistical and narrative reasons. But here's what I think. This game is a very old-school style game, and it was created with a very old-school business transaction. Private Division paid Obsidian A to do X, and then Y, and Z. Obsidian used all of A to create most of X, and then Y and Z. Since these things have to be planned long in advance, Y and Z were always planned to be standalone episodes that really had no latitude or ability to fix up what may have gone wrong with X. Peril on Gorgon and Murder on Eridanos unlock when you complete all that stuff on Monarch. So hey, this is uh, Editor Nick from the future, and I just want to do a little uh, correction here. You can actually access Murder on Eridanos just by getting the Stellar Bay uh, landing point unlocked. You don't actually need to complete the entire Monarch thing, but it is level 30 content, so uh, it's better that you wait till then anyway. So anyway, here back to the review. Bye-bye. This fits very well with how RPGs and MMOs add content to extend the progression treadmill, so it makes sense that these episodes would be placed here. So yes, you still need to push through a limp-wristed finale to a very problematic story, but the trade-off, if you own this DLC, is you now get the game's best content. Yes, the DLC includes the best content in the entire game and you have to buy it separately. Way back in 2014, when I wrote it, versus 2015 when it released, I expressed some thoughts on downloadable content. And to be fair, I was ranting about a racing game and packs of cars versus expansion packs of storyline like we used to have in the good old days. I've never really felt comfortable about the value of DLC, so I've never actually bought it, and I was understandably skeptical about what Gorgon and Aerodonos would bring to the table. These two episodes serve as exposés into the grimy underpinnings of Spacer's Choice and Rizzo's. They work in large part because even though they weave right into the tone and lore of the base game, they also have strongly established arcs of their own. 
These feel like elaborate episodes of, say, Futurama crammed into the storyline of this game with interesting characters and memorable places to go, and playing all these, well, everything yes, in the main I game just felt really boring in comparison. I mean, really, up to this point, how much of this game will you remember? How much of the terrain you've marched over is bespoke or interesting and not interchangeable with the features of many other games? The new worlds that Obsidian crafted for their DLC will make you wonder, why were they saving so much of their imagination creating this game just to stow it in content that far fewer people will experience? Being an interesting game, Gorgon starts off in an interesting way. Ada informs you that you have a parcel, and hey, it's a severed arm with a message. The crew gathers in the kitchen, and we discover that this is the former arm of one Lucky Montoya, and if we're hearing this message, he's probably dead. He owed Alex Hawthorne a favor, and this is it. A grand prize on Gorgon. Just go meet Wilhelmina Ambrose, who Montoya worked for. Minnie is heir to the Ambrose fortune, and you meet her in her largely mothballed estate on this tiny asteroid next to this big domed asteroid, the mysterious Gorgon. Walking in here, I thought this was going to be some setup for an Agatha Christie-style mystery, a suspicion augmented by the fact that I had finally seen Knives Out, which was a similarly inspired whodunit. But Gorgon isn't quite like that. You need to figure out why Spacer's Choice abandoned Gorgon, once a prominent research lab with many employees. What happened here? Minnie wants you to find out what happened to this place, once headed by her mother, so she can rehabilitate her family's name. Of course, she hires you to do all the work. It turns out that within this massive Gorgon facility, Spacer's Choice developed Adrena Time, a drug you can use to move faster and swipe faster with melee weapons. It has a cool jingle, too. Show your boss that you are prime, because you take Adrena Time. Spacer's Choice's heart seemed to be in the right place, though. They produced this drug to give the poor an advantage in productivity and maximize their lives. Unfortunately, there were also some pretty drastic side effects, and as you make your way through the production facilities, you realize how severe they are. There's a museum here, and of course, the interior design is freaking incredible. The exterior of Gorgon is protected by a glass dome, and once you get beyond the landing pad and the dive bar, you're navigating canyons, admiring grass, and killing marauders working from facility to facility. You're also warned about Charles from accounting, and yeah, it turns out that dude is bad news. Yes, Charles from accounting is a named enemy in this game. Plowing through these areas, you encounter the bowler-wearing mysterious figure who taunts you Shodan style. No, it's not Reed Thompson from Edgewater, but I'm not gonna lie, you can probably deduce who it is pretty quick. You may even know who it is right now, just watching this video. Where Peril on Gorgon thankfully breaks habit is about two-thirds through this pocket storyline when it sends you off rock you to track down former Gorgon scientists on places as far flung as Byzantium, the Groundbreaker, and a floating station over a gas giant. It's this dynamism and mandatory usage of your ship that really grants Gorgon some adventure beyond the mystery of, well, Gorgon. This DLC delivers the sensation in such a small maneuver that there's a reason to even own your ship, rather than just taking an interstellar greyhound from rock to rock. This is what made me feel that the golden path of the main game was so underwhelming as a narrative vehicle. What we discover as we dive deeper into the Gorgon Nightmare is that some proportion of Adrena Time users experience psychosis, insanity, and other surprising physical ailments. As a result, Spacer's Choice inadvertently created Marauders, the violent, crazed human opponents you run into throughout the system. The Marauders, in turn, are reflected upon in some circles as the deserters that we talked about some time ago. To be a Marauder, then, is this kind of moral failing, rather than the result of an unethically created drug. Somehow, Adrena Time made it out despite Spacer's Choice shutting down the entire facility. It's genuinely terrifying what happened to the test subjects here, but it's also horrible to think of the countless number of those you've slaughtered on the way here who really had little to no choice in what would become of them because of corporate censorship. Reading through some of the correspondence here reveals pure evil among the staff. As it turns out, the mysterious figure who doesn't actually kill you despite their consistent threats is Olivia Ambrose, the director of Gorgon who gradually understood what terror she had inflicted on the people of Halcyon. In the end, you must choose between the elder and younger Ambrose's intention with Adrena Time. 
Olivia wants the facility destroyed for good. Minnie wants to reformulate the drug to reduce the terrifying side effects and attempt the whole experiment again since Adrena Time could potentially help far more people than harm and narrow the class gap. Having just emerged from Gorgon's cruelest facility, I wasn't inclined to see this experiment potentially repeated, so I went with Olivia. The result was another disappointing march on the Ambrose Manor to kill Minnie. There are a lot of skill checks in these DLCs that are incredibly high, and even with my points liberally applied in speech skills, there were options well out of reach, like sparing Minnie's life. Despite the flat conclusion and the fact that unlucky Montoya disappears quickly into the narrative, Peril on Gorgon is an incredible slice of the game. Being able to probe the cruelty of this hyper-capitalist monster set in the exotic darkness of this asteroid was a trip. Then there's the Oops facility, and the part where pirates attempted to board your ship, and hopping on top of this model of Edgewater, and this bar. But then, a murder happened. Halcyon Helen is an Aetherwave action-adventure star, and she's just been murdered. Well, her actress was, anyway. You do know that Halcyon Helen is a fictional character portrayed by the late actress, Ruth Bellamy, yes? As I entered production on this review, I was under the false impression that there would be a third DLC, and having completed Gorgon and the game, I thought we were A-OK -okay to get this review produced. I wasn't really willing to wait another year for some final DLC, and I got to experience Peril on Gorgon as it was designed, which was as an experience baked right into the game. Murder on Eridanos, however, would be the final episode of content for the Outer Worlds, so rather than produce a review without it, I decided to tackle the $15 DLC and beat it over a few days, and I'm glad I did. Like Peril on Gorgon, even if Eridanos doesn't expand on the master narrative, it's still got more good story that you wish the rest of the game were more consistent with. The Eridanos platform is a floating station of smaller platforms tied together with slung bridges surrounding a massive hotel the Grand Colonial, over a gas giant. Hmm... Eridanos is managed, and I'm still not entirely sure how this works, by Sublight Underground, a division of Sublight. The insincere Ludovico runs the platform while the enigmatic Kincannon runs Slug's operation here, and they really don't like each other. Rizzo's is a major client on Eridanos with a big drink production presence and R&D facility. Oh, and Halcyon Helen is... Dead. She was slated to debut Rizzo's new Spectrum Vodka Brown, and yes, the game does offer plenty of opportunities to explore the entire Spectrum. Ludovico and Kincannon contract you to investigate the crime as a high-profile character in Halcyon as of the point where you can play this DLC. Your title and role as Inspector grants you an automatic in with virtually every character on Eridanos to resolve the mystery, and there are plenty of characters with plenty of motives and means to murder Helen. Helping you through this mystery is a new tool, the Discrepancy Amplifier. Yes, it's another weak science weapon when you're trying to use it like one, but its primary mode allows you to investigate clues in the environment in exchange for snarky evaluation. It's a little finicky at times selecting stuff, and it took me a full 10 minutes to figure out how to actually use it because I mentally skipped over this sliver of text that displays only once. But it's an effective new mechanic that makes Murder on Eridano stand out even more. It does get annoying when it points out each individual set of footprints in the game when you're trying to track Helen down, though. There are plenty of places to investigate. The orchards host waspskeeto hives and employees who have been happily compromised by evil dopamine-dripping slugs. Oh my! Birdie? A murderer? Well, everyone has their flaws! I'll be sure not to bring it up on our first date! The wilderness is where they shoot aetherwave dramas. The Grand Colonial is a spectrum of opulence from your penthouse digs to the dingy and dark staff level where employees starve to death inside their pods because their door gets stuck and they can't slip the service request under the door to get it fixed because they're starving to death. It's a dark place of misery and to top it all off there's a sprat of unusual size lurking about. Helen's co-stars are anchored in the VIP level, alongside the aftermath of inebriated cattle stomping around thanks to some rowdy tossball players. As the investigation progresses, people start ending up dead, along with the investigation itself. There's no actual deduction work here, and only one moment where you need to explicitly draw a conclusion about who you think murdered Helen, or anything else really. 
but it doesn't matter in the slightest. Your investigation involves plundering a character's dialogue tree, wandering to the next point on the map, picking up an item, traveling to the next point on the map, scanning something with that discrepancy amplifier, rinse and repeat. If you're loaded up on side quests, multiply that. It's extremely dry mechanically, and despite how interesting these characters are or how exciting it was to make progress in this case, the mechanics of investigation really ate it up after a while. Of course, like the main storyline that we're close to swinging back to, those side quests tended to sludge toward the end, requiring me to hop around and get hyper-transactional with the game's objectives. I can't really blame the game for this. Like I mentioned earlier, I opted to do all these side quests for the sake of seeing as much of the game's content as possible, and then also wanted them completed before the end of the DLC story arc, so they just kinda gathered at the bottom. While I've never intentionally done as many quests as possible in an RPG like this, I do feel like like the quests were exposed a little bit more organically in other games, like Bethesda's games. This really only becomes a forced issue because once you name the murderer, the end game kicks off and you can't complete those quests anymore. Now I don't actually want to detail the conclusion here, but I do want to mention a highlight. The hardcore eye candy that is the inside of this Rizzo's distillery. It looks like all of the charming bits of a Wurlitzer made into a full interior design. It fringes into being visually overwhelming as a Lisa Frankian nightmare, but I can't get enough of it. Murder on Eridanos wraps up all its ties incredibly well and joins Gorgon as another shiny example of what this game could be. Unfortunately, it's also the last of it. So now we hop back to the storyline of the main game. Phineas's lab actually opens up early on and you do have to visit it at least once before now. Being the lair of a mad scientist, it's kind of odd that most of this facility is the dock where the unreliable perches like a loyal bird. The actual lab itself is, well, tiny and uneventful. Except for bubbles. You're here now to get a nav key to land on Byzantium. Ah yes, the capital city of the colony, the crown of Halcyon, Byzantium. And boy it's fancy. Look at all this architecture, and this government office, and this bar. Byzantines love to remind you that you are absolutely out of place here. There's even a Karen who recruits you for her own jealous purposes. She wants to know what she's missing out on by not being accepted into a special early retirement program that promises even more incredible luxury. The reality, you discover, is a lot more grim. Not that she needs to know that. Here, take your payment. I have to fetch my things. I don't care what I have to do. They'll give me luxury or give me death. There are a lot of hot spots in Byzantium. You can perform a screen test at Odeon Pictures that can go any way you want it to. Clarence mostly from Gorgon will help you if you steal the teacup canid trophy for the dog he didn't even submit into competition. Phineas wants you to meet his contact here and she wants you to meet with Minister Clark who has been under house arrest for an age. Clark points you to Chairman Rockwell's office which was easy to access with all those extra levels I tacked on working through Gorgon first. It's here that the Chairman's evil plot is revealed in its entirety. Halcyon is screwed. Farms can't produce food with adequate nutrients to keep people healthy, and inevitably, the colony will fold with the pain of famine and death. The board's plan, then, is to reclaim the hope, space its frozen human cargo from Earth, and load it up with Halcyon colonists, reviving them as they have the ability to support them again. Essentially, it's applying a tourniquet to the world outside Byzantium while they try to solve the colony's devastating problems. Once that's accomplished, they can restore the world, presumably under the same cruel dystopia that exists now, but you know what? People will still be alive. It's framed as this evil product of a cast of bureaucratic sociopaths, but it actually also comes across as incredibly practical and plausible considering the resources of the colony. In fact, Ajuntant Akande recruits you to cut off Edgewater, the company of town that I left for dead, by framing it as a mercy killing. It's a product of the game's lack of morality that makes this a possible conclusion without the game wagging its finger in your face and saying, hey, hey, this is bad, and you'll get dark side points for doing it. In a hidden lab here, you can finally acquire the chemicals that Phineas wanted dozens of hours ago. You'll also have a couple options about how to handle it as you run headlong into the endgame funnel. The Hope is a valuable ship to the goals of both the board and Phineas. Inside feels a lot like its sister ship, the Groundbreaker, 
but it's abbreviated for narrative purposes. While I didn't run into much of it because I was mentally fixed on finishing the game, there are plenty of terminals here that detail a terrifying narrative of what actually happened on this ship before it was lost. I mean, they didn't warp to hell or anything, but well, you really should take your time and read up. After interfacing Ada into the ship's computer, I skipped the hope to Terra 2 for Phineas rather than Tartarus, which is what the board wants. While this is happening, the board manages to find and breach Phineas's lab, kidnapping him in the process. The only way forward now is through Tartarus, the board's prison world, to free Phineas and save Halcyon once and for all. With a hearty gathering of the crew in which they confirm their commitment to you and your decision, it's time to go, which engages a point of no return ride to the climax. Better have a save point ready. After a splash screen that looks like it was assembled in haste, the board warns you that you're going to have a hard time getting in here. This is a full-on assault of their last hold and host of the Labyrinth, the prison complex at its core. But you're not alone. The various factions that you've aligned yourself with through the game will join you in the assault. The labyrinth isn't actually a maze, but I kinda wish it was. The straightforward action set piece here made me feel weird, honestly. It's hardly the first, it's not quite the last, but its placement in a game that has such a bias towards exploration and dialogue over combat reminds me that this conclusion was an abbreviated effort, accomplished in the winning moments of the game's development. It rhymes with the climax of so many films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or all of them, which is a multi-threaded expensive looking battle with explosions and punching and guns firing and whatever. Here on Tartarus, fighting UDL soldiers and level after level of the labyrinth made me yearn for the humble days in Edgewater when I was asking people how awful their lives were and getting some really heartfelt responses that cloaked their insecurities. Did acquiring Phineas's chemicals really require me to single-handedly change the destiny of the entire Halcyon system? I mean, within mere weeks of my thawing out from a drifting colony ship having previously worked as a elevator operator? I mean, it was cool in Deus Ex when I went from nano-augmented super agent to world-shaping hero over the course of 20 hours, and maybe this narrative zoom is the standard for role-playing games with mass appeal now. But Deus Ex was 21 years ago, and even if it wasn't the first to employ this kind of narrative device, it's felt older and, ironically, more limiting with each game that's passed through since. Beyond the labyrinth is Chairman Rockwell and a final boss, the mechanical ram with a shield that tested every last one of my combat skills. My companions folded after a few minutes, but after dealing with waves of drone ads, it became a dance of keep away. Dash away to inhale a drug cocktail, then dash back in to deal massive damage before dashing away to do it all again. With ram destroyed, it's time to take care of Chairman Rockwell, which I do with bullets. <sighs> and then I free Phineas. He informs me that Halcyon lost contact with Earth years ago. Despite Minister Clark's optimism, there is no backup or cavalry coming from our home system. We have to figure this all out on our own, and we've got to do it based on all of the decisions you've already made to this point. If you're familiar with Obsidian games or the Fallout games, you're going to be very familiar with how the Outer Worlds doles out its resolution. How you resolved quests, or didn't, will be reflected upon and expanded in a narrated slideshow. This conclusion goes over the fate of each individual world, an individual character, and companion before the colony as a whole. It's both specific and vague in ways that are satisfying and troubling, I guess. Watching my personalized conclusion, it felt like it was being told from just far enough in the future to describe how a lot of things turned out, but not far out enough to really feel like I understood what happened on a grand scale. The fate of me, the player character, the stranger, feels the most mysterious of all, and as it rolled into the credits, I felt vaguely unsatisfied. Looking through the amalgamated fan wiki mesh of endings that spells out the variety of ways this slideshow can change, it never really seems like the ending becomes clearer based on what I did, just different. This may all be fine and dandy for pretty much everyone else, and I'm being just oddly particular and that's fine, I'll be the villain, but I feel this conclusion created almost as many questions as answers. Since I beat the game before completing Murder on Eridanos, I didn't get those slides in my ending, but you know what? I think I know what happened there, and I'm good. Thrilling tales of the unreliable. Or maybe spine-chilling stories from the edge of a system. 
was also considering astounding adventures in the other. I'm partial to that last one. So yeah, The Outer Worlds is an interesting game. It's got a lot of great writing and humor. The art is inspired. The setting is fascinating. I laughed a lot more times here than I've laughed in a lot of other games that were genuinely trying. I'm probably not going to remember a lot of these characters, but their stories of loss and oppression and their sometimes hesitant optimism, despite such dire conditions, speaks a lot about the game's opinion on humankind, which really sets it apart from the dystopias of so, so many other games. When the story got uninteresting on its own, and it sure heckin' did at times, there was little to nothing to remedy that. Other games, even older games, get through this by being more concise with their dialogue, rather than throwing a phone book at you with each new character. And while I appreciate the humanity on display here, the Outer Worlds thematic deployment of consumerism and megacorporate greed felt like the crutchiest crutch that ever crutched. We get it guys, we know it's bad, so what do you have to say about resolving the madness that is hypercapitalism in Halcyon, or in the real world, that doesn't involve high speech skills or a really powerful modded out minigun? Well, not much at all. Playing through the game is a really standard affair, to the point of distraction. It's clear the ambition wasn't in what new tools they could bring to the table, but in what they could do with them. So while they reach some dramatic peaks with the story, actually playing the game to experience those moments could be a real drag. I suppose the solution is that I could have just ignored the endless banter and killed everyone, but that's not really what I wanted to do or how I wanted to play the game. That felt wrong. I know that playing this game for review is a very different experience than if I were simply playing it for the sake of playing it. For one, I probably wouldn't have bought it at all, considering its reputation. For two, I probably would have gotten tired of it at some point, stopped playing it for a few months, returned, not knowing what the hell was going on, and then given up entirely. For three, I would have never purchased or played the DLC, which is again, the strongest content in the game, on the basis of the slow-paced, tension-free master narrative, in which the driving reason to get me to the end was rarely anything that the game was doing, but rather me wanting to get through it. There are flashes of brilliance here, despite the fact that Obsidian clearly bit off more than it could chew. This is a game that clearly would have benefited from the AAA treatment, or even an MMO, you know, a decade ago. If another one of these is up your alley, I wager you've already played through it and already know how you feel about the game. Playing The Outer Worlds felt like entry-level work as often as it felt like it had something interesting to say, and I can accept that to an extent, for a certain amount of time but not quite as long as Obsidian was expecting it from me. The Outer Worlds isn't a bad game by any means, but it's an uneven experience. At its worst, it's painfully, numbingly average. And I can hear it now. Oh, this just wasn't a game for you, Nick. No, actually, this was exactly a game for me, which means I can understand precisely when it soars and precisely when it's just faffing about chasing its tail. I've been playing CRPGs like this for over 20 years. I freaking get it. I now understand why this game disappeared when it came to hand out accolades and why critics largely forgot it. It makes complete sense now. So here's my recommendation. If this kind of game is up your alley, be absolutely 100% freaking darn sure that you grab the DLC because otherwise you'll be forgetting the outer worlds as well. It may not be the first, but it is the nth review. I've been your host, Nick. If you haven't already, go ahead and click that like button. It's down over here somewhere. Uh, and if you haven't subscribed, I mean, please subscribe. That'd be great. I mentioned Patreon earlier, but I do need to thank my producers for allowing this review to happen, for allowing the, uh, the channel to happen. And if you'd like to see more reviews like this quicker, Supporting the Nth Review Patreon is the best way to do it. Hop into Discord for the Nth Review Discord link. It's down in the description below. Uh, it's free to everyone, but Patreon supporters get their special channel as well. Don't forget to follow the Nth Review on like so many social media vehicles. There are everywhere. Whatever you've got, chances are you can follow the Nth Review somewhere. And don't forget to tune in on Saturday afternoons where we broadcast here from the green room. Uh, we play older games, newer games, just a little bit of everything, and we just chill. It's a gaming stream for people who don't like gaming streams. Uh, come in and join in the chat, and if you like the review, you can. I, I will respond probably to your feedback then. Uh, and if you don't like the review, I 
well, we'll see. I hope you enjoyed the show, and hey, I'll see you next time.